two, one. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you rejoining us from around the globe for day three of the Rush Neurology Therapeutics and Management Virtual Conference. We hope you have enjoyed all the talks thus far, and we are delighted to present two additional sessions to you today. I'm Charles Marcaccilli, a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist here at Rush University Medical Center, where I also serve as Section Chief of Child Neurology and Director of the Pediatric Epilepsy Program. I've been given the honor and pleasure of moderating our first session, Updates in Pediatric Neurology. While we have included individual lectures pertaining to pediatric neurological disorders in the past, in past symposia for the 2023 virtual conference, we have dedicated an entire session exploring therapeutic and management updates to common clinical neurological problems affecting children. In the second uh, session, Dr. Adriana bermeo Valli along with our esteemed colleagues, will continue the exploration of neurological disorders throughout the life cycle of both men and women by moderating a session entitled Age and Gender Considerations in the Management of Neurological Disease. During these sections, these sessions, we encourage you to utilize the question and answer tab to ask any questions or provide any comments you may have during the lectures. While some of these questions may be answered in real time, our panel of experts, along with the respective moderator, will reconvene at the end of each session to, re, to further expound upon pertinent issues, thereby hopefully providing a uh, lively interactive discussion. So without further ado, let us begin. For our first inaugural session entirely dedicated to pediatric neurology and developmental behavioral pediatrics, we provide therapeutic and management updates for three clinical problems commonly seen in a general pediatric clinic. Dr. Colleen Burfin will begin our session by discussing the management of migraines and other headaches in children. This is an extremely timely topic as the frequency of chronic headaches and chronic daily headaches increased dramatically during the pandemic, especially as many children reported decreased physical activity during this time. Dr. Burfin's talk will include a discussion on some of the newer agents used to treat headaches, such as calcitonin gene-related peptide inhibitors. 
Dr. Luba Romanceva will follow in providing an update in the management of pediatric epilepsy. This talk will focus on the epilepsies, uh, those epilepsies resulting in developmental epileptic encephalopathies. While she dis will discuss uh, recent FDA approved medications for the treatment of intractable epilepsy, some of her talk will be devoted to recent advances in understanding the genetics of epilepsy. Dr. Romanceva will be followed by Dr. Cesar Ochoa, a developmental behavioral pediatrician who will provide an update on the assessment of children with autism spectrum disorders. An investigator on multiple clinical trials for autism and other neuro neurodevelopmental disorders, Dr. Ochoa will further explore the role of genetics as an underlying cause of autistic spectrum disorders. As you will see, a common theme of today's talk talks regards the important role genetics plays in understanding and furthermore treating neurological diseases in both children and adults. It has been said that on average, it can take up to 17 years to see the fruits of basic science research and the treatment of disease afflicting patients. Our final speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Barry Kravis, will close by providing a game-changing state-of-the-art update on where we are in moving pediatric neurology and developmental behavioral pediatrics from a diagnostic specialty to a specialty capable of providing disease-targeted treatments. While genetic and metabolic disorders are individually rare as a group, they are actually quite common, underscoring the importance in developing such uh, treatments. At the end of the lectures, we will have ample time for what I hope will be an engaging discussion. Our first speaker is Dr. Colleen Burfine. She is a board-certified general pediatric neurologist and assistant professor at Rush University Medical School Center. Uh, she has been at Rush since 2006, where she evaluated and treated patients with a variety of neurological disorders. At Rush University Medical Center, Dr. Burfine has established a multidisciplinary clinic for patients with Rett syndrome and has been awarded a center of excellence uh, for this condition. She works with a team of people to provide comprehensive care for patients with Rett syndrome and has been involved in several clinical trials designed to study potential treatments. Dr. Burfind. So today I'm going to be talking about the treatment of headaches in adolescents and children with a focus on migraine headaches. The prevalence of migraine headaches in the pediatric population is 60%. They're more prevalent in females than males, and 75% of children report a headache by 15 years of age, with 10% reporting recurring headaches. Headaches are rare before the age of four years of, before the age of four and peak at 13 years of age. When we talk about specific headache types, the prevalence of migraine headaches is about 8%. Prior to puberty, uh, boys and girls are equally effective affected with migraine headaches, but as the children grow, girls, uh, headaches become more prevalent in girls than in boys, such that 10% of girls and 6% of boys report migraine headaches um, up to the age of 20. Tension headaches are more common than migraine headaches, but they do not, um, but they not, are not as disabling as migraine headaches. The trigeminal autonomic cephalgias are rare, and in fact, cluster headaches occur in less than 1% of adolescents. The freak um, frequent or daily headaches do occur in about 1 to 1.5 percent of um, headaches in children. Um, so why do we care? Well, migraine is a leading cause of disability in ages 15 to 49 year olds. Children with migraine headaches and tension headaches have an increased likelihood of learning disabilities. There's also an increase in absenteeism, especially those with migraine headaches, and migraines in, um, have um, impair the quality of life similar to other chronic illnesses such as cancer and rheumatoid arthritis. So given that um, headaches, migraine headaches are so disabling, we are going to um, talk about the treatment of migraine headaches. We're going to start by discussing um, the acute treatment of migraine headaches. Prior to going into specific studies, um, it is important to discuss that uh, the pediatric uh, randomized control studies um, unfortunately show a high placebo response, making it difficult to calculate a statistically significant difference between a statistically significant difference between trial drug and placebo. The reason for this may be that all treatment trials in children and adolescents are done after a drug has proven efficacy in adults, so that when the children enter the, the drug study, um, there is an expectation that um, this drug, the drug will work as it has in the adults. So this expectation response likely adds to the placebo effect. There was a, uh, a study that was done that evaluated um, the study uh, design in clinical trials of pediatric migraine headaches. And what they found is that the trials included both a parallel 
um, or a crossover design. They found that the crossover design had a higher probability of, re of revealing significant differences between placebo versus the study drug. So future um, studies may want to consider um, the trial des the, their, uh, their trial design and possibly use the crossover design. So um, the American Academy of Neuro Neurology and the American Headache Society set out to try to determine what were the best uh, medications to treat acute uh, migraines in children. They reviewed the literature. Um, they found they only used randomized controls, control trials. Um, they looked um, between um, the years 2003 and 2014. Of course, they used the pediatric population and the, the study needed to include both the study drug as well as placebo. Um, here is a graph of what they found, the pain outcomes as well as the confidence and evidence. Um, and what they found is that the sumatriptan and naproxen oral tablets at various doses, as well as, well as the zolmatriptan nasal spray, the five milligram dose, was more likely than placebo um, to, uh, to eliminate uh, headaches at the two hour interval. They also found that zolmatriptan five milligram nasal spray, as well as ibuprofen and sumatriptan nasal spray at 20 milligrams was probably more likely than placebo to eliminate headaches at, here at the one hour mark and, and then also here at the two hour mark. Finally, they found that, rizos, that rizotriptan, the orally disintegrating tablet at both five and 10 milligrams was possibly more likely than the placebo to eliminate headaches. So their conclusion was that in treating acute headaches in children, that you, that you be, children and adolescents, that you begin with ibuprofen. Ibuprofen should be the initial drug of choice, although in clinical practice, we also try other non-steroidal inflammatory drugs such as naproxen as well as Tylenol. If the ibuprofen doesn't work, they say in adolescents, that you use the tryptans and you use the following tryptans, sumatriptan, naproxen, the oral, um, the oral tablet, the zomotriptan, the nasal saline, the nasal spray, five milligrams, the sumatriptan, nasal spray, 20 milligrams, rizotriptan and amotriptan. I have underlined here the rizotriptan because this particular tryptan has been shown to be efficacious and safe um, in children and has been approved in children under the age of 12. So if you have a very young child who would like to, um, who requires a, uh, a, medic, a treatment for, a medic, for migraine headaches, we can consider the rizotriptan. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about the tryptans. Tryptans are serotonin receptor agonists. They work on the 5-HT1B slash D receptors. Um, their mechanism is one, they cause vasoconstriction in the intracranial extracerebral vascular, um, vascular arteries. Two, they cause, they inhibit the, noce, the nociceptive neurotransmission in the brainstem. And three, they inhibit the release of vasoactive neuropeptides by trigeminal nerve endings in the intracranial vessels. The main side effects are GI, GI upset, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, drowsiness, chest tightness, and discomfort. Some of the drawbacks is that some of the patients do not respond to the tryptans. Many will have recurrent headaches. It works for a while, and then the headache returns. There are definite contraindications, and they can cause medication overuse. So what are the contraindications to tryptans? According to the FDA, tryptans are contraindicated if a patient has a history of cardiovascular disease, such as stroke TIA or myocardial infarction. And this, because, this is because the tryptans can cause vasoconstriction. They're also contraindicated in cardiac accessory conduction pathway disorders, such as um, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Both of these um, are uh, rare in the pediatric population, but if they do have either, you need to avoid giving tryptans to the pediatric patients. Finally, um, in the past, um, tryptans were thought to be contraindicated in migraine with aura. Adult studies have shown that if you have a typical aura, that tryptans are safe to use, such as the visual aura or sensory aura. This is because the vascular, vascular theory of migraine is, is typically is, is out of favor. The problem arises when you have a complex aura, which may um, be difficult to differentiate from a TIA. In this case, um, you do not want to use um, uh, a tryptan until you know that it is not a TIA. And in fact, the FDA um, um, contraindicates contra the use of tryptans and in in, in migraines with complex auras. So now we're going to talk about the prevention of migraine headaches. The, um, prevention of migraine headaches aims at reducing the frequency and severity of migraine headaches. Um, again, the American Academy of Neurology and the American Headache Society set out again to determine what were the best medications in terms of headache, uh, migraine headache prevention in children. Um, again, they reviewed the literature, there were randomized controlled trials, they 
um, included um, only pediatric patients from three, three years to 18 years of age. Um, they found that there were actually five or 15 good studies, um, and we are now going to talk about their results. Um, again, they found in the preventative treatment, um, in, in the preventative trials, that there was a high placebo response. In the randomized control trials, they state that the majority of preventative medications did not show superiority to placebo in children and adolescents. In fact, um, the placebo arm um, showed that 30 to 61 percent of subjects had a 50 percent or greater reduction in headache frequency. Um, but they did make some determinations, um, and we're going to discuss those. First of all, amitriptyline um, was found to be effective only if it was combined with cognitive behavioral therapy. The problem with this is that it's difficult to get patients into cognitive behavioral um, therapy, so this may not be the, your first go-to when you're looking for a preventative medication. Here, um, they found that propanolol was possibly more likely to cause a 50% reduction in headache frequency over placebo, and topamax was probably more likely to cause um, a reduction in headache frequency. So if you have to choose a preventative, topamax um, here um, is probably the easiest and most likely effective, the easiest and probably the most likely um, to be effective. Um, when using propanol or amitriptyline without CBT, CBT. So I would start with Topamax, go with propanol, and then go with, um, uh, consider amitriptyline combined with CBT. Um, there was insufficient evidence to recommend calcium channel blockers, um, Depakote, or Botox for chronic migraines. What was not studied was zonisamide, gabapentin, Keppra, or ciproheptadine. Cipro um, so we just don't have data on those medications. Um, so they recommended, um, ways in which to counsel patients with regards to preventative treatment. They said to consider the use in children with a minimum of four headache days per month or three to four migraine attacks per month for at least three months or significant migraine related disabilities. So, so they do recommend that in, in those cases. They also recommend discussing with the family that the placebo effect was effective, that most preventative medications were not superior to placebo, but then to talk about the limitations of the clinical trials. Then finally, um, discuss the possibility of using the short, uh, short preventative um, trials um, and, see if, and see if they are helpful. They recommend if you do use a preventative that you give, um, use it for at least two months because the headache frequencies often vary and you're going to need some time to determine whether or not the preventative medications are effective. Um, we're going to talk now about neurologic, neuropharm, non-pharmacologic interventions. Um, the nutraceuticals um, in the treat we use nutraceuticals often in the treatment of pediatric migraine headaches. But what is the data? There was a study that was published um, that did a literature review, a literature review and looked at. They found that there were 21 studies that looked at um, the treatment of the nutraceuticals. Specific specifically, um, they looked at vitamin D, riboflavin, coenzyme Q10, magnesium, butterbur, and polysaturated fatty acids. They found that the quality of evidence was very low, and they were not able to make firm conclusions or recommendations regarding the use of the nutraceuticals. They did show that coenzyme Q10 and magnesium had a trend for improvement and that they were safe to give. So given that placebo um, is effective in treating migraine headaches, one might consider using um, coenzyme Q10 or magnesium in the, in the event that one placebo may be, you know, they may act as a placebo, and also there, that there is a trend for improvement. A word about melatonin. There is some data that supports the efficacy of the use of melatonin in preventative medication um, in the pediatric population. The problem with melatonin is that it um, causes um, significant drowsiness and even causes some of the patients to fall asleep. So if you have um, a child or children, um, pediatric patients that have migraine headaches more later on the day or in the evening, melatonin would be something that you, you should try because they're going to fall asleep anyways. So consider that in the pediatric population as a preventative. Um, there are certain neuromodulating, um, neuromodulatory devices, um, and they are used um, and proven effective in the adults with migraine headaches. They are both used in acute migraine headaches as well as the preventive, as, as well as a preventative. Um, the two here in green have shown some efficacy for the acute treatment in adolescents. That includes a single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulator, as well as remote electrical neuromodulation. So you can think about both of these for the acute treatment of migraine headaches. Um, with regards to preventative um, treatment, um, the, the single pulse transcranial magnetic stimulation for migraine um, has been um, approved in the pediatric population based on, at least one of the reasons, is based on a, a pilot open label study 
that showed that there was an improvement or clinical response to single pulse TMS over a 12 week period. What they do, how they use this is they give four single pulses twice daily. Um, and here's the data, um, the, they measured um, uh, headaches day per month, moderate severe pain days, how often they had to take acute medications and the disability score. And they showed that when they looked at, when they looked at the baseline versus post-treatment, that there was a reduction um, in all of, um, of uh, the measured outcomes. And so they do recommend, the FDA did approve this um, for the use in, uh, in adolescents. However, um, there are some drawbacks. The sample size was small because it was a pilot study. The study there was no sham control and so forth. And so further, uh, further evaluation um, would, would be, would be uh, optimal. Um, I'm, now I want to talk about the new, new migraine medications that are not, a, not yet approved by the FDA for children and adolescents. Um, so calcitonin gene-related peptide is a neuro, or CGRP, is a neuropeptide involved in the pathogenesis of, my, pathogenesis of migraine headaches. Um, there is a large concentration of CGRP in the trigeminal ganglion neurons. And CGRP is known to cause vasodilation of the cranial arteries. It is also known to cause neurogenic inflammation. Um, and it does so by um, increasing the release of substance P, which causes leaky blood vessels, it also causes the release of inflammatory modulators like tumor necrosis factor, as well as mast cell activation. These substances then activate the nociceptors on the blood vessels, and they, which triggers the trigeminal pathway, which you can see over here. Um, this trigeminal, um, in addition um, to CGRP being released out here on the blood vessels, it is also found to be within the central nervous system itself, so for example, within the hypothalamus and other areas of the brain. Um, the CGRP within the brain is thought to enhance um, glutaminergic singling and truly an amplifies the headache pain. So since CGRP is related in, um, in, to uh, migraine headaches, um, we now have CGRP uh, blockers, including CGR, which include CGRP monoclonal antibodies. The CGRP monoclonal antibodies have been proven to be effective in adults. In clinical trials, um, they were um, equally efficacious to other preventative medications. There was a 50% responder rate was found in 50 to 60% of the treatment groups, and the response is thought to occur long, over a long period of, of time. Um, so here are the various CGRP monoclonal antibodies. There are four of them. Um, there are three that bind to the ligon, and there is one that binds to the receptor. Um, the nice, uh, what, is, what is positive um, about the monoclonal antibodies is that they have a very long half-life. So the patients only have to receive um, treatment either quarterly or, or monthly. Um, I'd like to point out that eptanuzumab um, is given IV, um, and therefore it has a rapid onset of action. It, 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 it works within two to five hours. Um, the, the other medications can take up to five days to two weeks before you can potentially see a significant effect. Um, I'd also like to point out um, that Ernumab, er, er, um, that this medication has um, um, significant side effects and that it causes severe constipation, hy hypertension, and hypersensitivity reactions. The other medications here also are um, cause for, can cause uh, sensitivity reactions um, at the site of injection. And if that does happen, um, or they're afraid to um, um, inject themselves, then they can opt for possibly the IV administration of this medication. So those, um, so we do not, these have not yet, the CGRP monoclonal antibodies have not yet been approved in the pediatric adolescent population. Um, and so the pediatric adolescent headache section of the American Headache Society has made some recommendations for its off-label use. They had recommend that if a child um, or adolescent has greater or equal to eight headaches per month, then go ahead and try this. If their, dis if their um, disability score is very high, if they failed to preventive, preventative treatments, um, as well, and they recommend trying to use this on, um, in the adolescents, the people who have already gone through, uh, patients that have already gone through puberty, and they recommend avoiding this in, the, um, in patients who have um, immunologic disorders. Um, there are some contraindications as well. First of all, CGRP is, uh, it can stimulate bone growth, formation, and ossification, and therefore if you use it in a very young child that is still growing, 
um, you need to watch and make sure that they're that this does not impair the growth. You should avoid this um, in um, breakdown of the blood brain barrier, such as meningitis or neurosurgery. And then also CGRP causes vasodilation, so you have to be aware um, and you should um, avoid in stroke and cardiovascular diseases. Um, so I also want to point out um, again, we do not. Uh, there are um, other medications that are used um, for preventative in adults that have not been approved um, for children. And these are the GPANs. These are small CGRP receptor antagonists. These are, they, are, they do not penetrate the blood brain barrier very well. They're well tolerated. Um, the nice thing about them is that they're well tolerated. Um, and the most common side effects are nausea and constipation. There are two medications out for preventative treatment in adults, and these include the Rimigipant and Etogipant. Um, the GPANs are also used for the acute treatment of headaches. Um, compared to the triptans, they're slightly, they're, they have a slightly slower onset of action, but they do, not cause they do not cause transformation from episodic migraine to chronic migraines. Um, the more you give this medication, the less frequent are the headaches, and that's why they have been now approved, or at least a couple of them have been approved, approved for um, preventative treatment of migraine headaches. To name these, the, the the Ubro G pad and the Rim G pad um, are used for the acute treatment. Again, like I said, we do not use, we have not been, we do not typically use these in the pediatric population, but there is hope that um, we will um, have this available to the pediatric population um, in the future once uh, they can be, uh, once studies are done and they're pro proven to be safe um, for the pediatric population. Um, there's another um, yet medication that I want to talk about, the Dytans. Um, this is specifically Lasmodytan. Um, it's a selective serotonin agonist, um, similar to the Triptans, but it um, works at a different receptor, the 5-HT1 app receptor. Um, this does not, this particular um, medication does not cause vasoconstriction, so you can use it in those um, who um, have uh, cardiovascular or cerebrovascular diseases. Um, because it gets into the brain, it can cause sedation, paresthesis, dizziness, um, as well as um, serotonin syndrome. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the preventative um, healthy habits. Um, there's some data to suggest that maintaining healthy, ha healthy life habits can prevent migraine headaches. So we do talk about healthy habits in the pediatric population. One, uh, there's a mnemonic called SMART, um, and S stands for sleep. So uh, we've talked we counsel patients um, and try to get a good history in terms of whether they're sleeping, you know, how, whether they're sleeping well. Because if they're not sleeping well, um, then sleep, um, poor sleep can contribute to um, migraine headaches. So we talk about how long, how long, it, we talk about sleep duration, talk about whether they're snoring, whether they're um, waking up at night and so forth. So, sleep, and we then counsel them on sleep hygiene. So sleep is very important. M stands for meals. We talk, they should eat three healthy meals plus two healthy snacks and they should eat a well-balanced well diet. Um, also under meals, we talk about caffeine. We, we recommend that they do not have, take, uh, in, that they limit their intake of caffeine, um, especially because um, caffeine can cause withdrawal headaches and dehydration, which can contribute to headaches. Um, we talk about hydration, that they should be, remain well hydrated to help prevent headaches. And A stands for activity level, that they should be active, um, that activity, um, has been shown to be beneficial in the treatment um, of migraine headaches. And then R stands for relaxation. If they're relaxed, they're less stressed because um, stress can trigger migraine headaches. And also if they have comorbid conditions such as anxiety or um, depression, um, those should be taken care of. Um, so now my question, which of the following are true regarding treatment of migraine headaches in children and adolescents?
D, all of the above. All of the above are recommended and outlined in the practice guidelines updated by uh, practice guideline updates put forth by the subcommittee of the American Academy of Neurology and the American Headache Society. They performed an extension literature review of acute and preventative treatment of migraine headaches and formed the above conclusions and recommendations. Great, thank you, Dr. Burfiend. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Luba Romantseva. Dr. Romantseva is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics in the section of child neurology. She obtained her medical degree from Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago. She then completed her pediatrics and child neurology training at the University of Chi uh, Chicago Medical Center, where our paths briefly crossed. Prior to her coming to Rush University, where she completed a clinical neurophysiology fellowship, we are very fortunate that she stayed on as faculty where she has played an integral role in developing our pediatric epilepsy program. In addition, she spends part of her time at Stroger Hospital here in Chicago where she serves as section chief of pediatric neurology. Her clinical interests range from treating pediatric patients with medically refractory epilepsy to psychogenic non-epileptic seizures in young adults. Uh, Dr. Romantseva. Hello, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak with you today. My name is Luba Ramansova and I'm a member of the Rush section of Child Neurology and I will be speaking to you um, to give you updates on the management of pediatric epilepsy. So here's the outline for the talk where we will discuss the concept of developmental epileptic encephalopathies of childhood and what implications that has for therapeutic targets for severe early life epilepsies. We will then touch on new anti-seizure medications for severe childhood epilepsies. Uh, discuss very briefly emerging therapies for rare epilepsies, namely ASOs, and also I will try to provide a very brief epilepsy genetics update. So we will start, as we often start, with uh, severe epilepsies with lenox gastaut syndrome. Just as a brief review, it is a severe epileptic encephalopathy of young childhood with onset between one and seven years of age with a peak incidence between three and five years of age with the three core features, including refractory seizures, characteristic EEG abnormalities, and cognitive impairment. The syndrome has diverse causes, including neonatal HIE, vascular injuries, usually neonatal period, congenital brain malformations, genetic and metabolic diseases. And of course, that results in a complex therapeutic target. lenox is characterized by refractory epilepsy, which impacts significantly the quality of life for both the patient and the family. These patients have increased the risk of both morbidity, such as falls and burns, as well as mortality, dying from SUDEP. There are cognitive and motor development uh, delays, um, which often worsen over time. And these patients often have comorbid behavioral sleep and feeding difficulties, which persist uh, throughout lifetime. And most adult uh, lenox gastaut patients remain dependent on family for their ADLs and financial support over lifetime. So again, reviewing, these are the three core features of refractory seizures of multiple types. Please notice tonic and itonic seizures and frequent episodes of non-convulsive status epilepticus, EEG abnormalities, uh, which are characteristic with interactive pattern of slow spike and wave, as well as paroxysmal fast activity, and coexistent cognitive impairment uh, of various types, including uh, overall intellectual disability, impaired psychomotor skills, uh, behavioral problems, and overall progressive encephalopathy. So now if we zoom out for a second, uh, we can think of lennox gastaut syndrome as an example of a developmental epileptic encephalopathy. This is not a new notion, but something that is important to think about um, as we reflect on why is it difficult to treat some pediatric epilepsies. And this is a condition, or rather many conditions, where seizures are just the tip of the iceberg of neurologic dysfunction. Are, these seizures are frequent and drug resistant, and there's a coexistent developmental delay, often with loss of skills. Persistent interactual epileptic discharges are thought to disrupt uh, physio normal physiologic awake and sleep rhythms, which are necessary for normal learning and neurodevelopment. And seizures here are thought to be more likely to be a symptom of the underlying neuronal network dysfunction, rather its main cause. It is very true that frequent seizures clearly worsen the neurologic prognosis, however, and definitely increase disability and pseudo risk. Developmental trajectory in DE is an interesting question. Um, as uh, depicted here in the graphic on the right-hand side, it does depend on both the underlying cause of the epileptic encephalopathy 
as well as overall seizure control. And therefore, I think it is important to think of an ultimate therapeutic goal in, uh, in such developmental epileptic encephalopathies um, as having the agents that reduce both, reduce both the seizure frequency, so anti-seizure medications, as well as the overall burden of intraxial abnormalities and attack the underlying cause of developmental disabilities. So again, Lennox Gusto is just one of the many, many developmental epileptic encephalopathies uh, that we currently know in uh, early 2023. There are over 50 conditions known. These are, have multiple mechanisms of dysfunction, such as channelopathies, transporter defects, synaptic dysfunction, transcription defects, and impaired DNA repair. In all of them, early life seizures are common, but not necessary. Uh, cognitive impairment and developmental regression are very common as well. There's a spectrum of clinical severity with variable inheritance patterns. Genotype phenotype correlation is incomplete at this point, or understanding of it rather is incomplete at this point. Temporal relationship between seizure onset and cognitive impairment varies. In some cases, developmental stagnation or regression may predate seizures or may continue to worsen even despite good seizure control. Compared to other epilepsy syndromes, developmental epileptic encephalopathies are relatively rare. However, because of the severe burden of refractory seizures and related disability, they result in a significant cost to the medical system, caregivers, and the society at large. And again, in a graphic form, here is a very partial list of some of these DEEs and related genes. And this, again, every time the slide is shown, it's already out of date. Right, so again, in this partial list, yet again, uh, of severe early life epilepsy genes, uh, we can contrast the classic Dravet syndrome phenotype where developmental problems are typically noted after seizure onset, uh, with something like uh, tuberous sclerosis complex or SCN2A phenotype, where developmental problems often predate seizures and can persist despite good seizure control. So to express this yet again in the diagram form, as you can tell I like diagrams, uh, we are moving away from thinking uh, that in epileptic encephalopathy it is the seizures which are the main source of encephalopathy and developmental problems. Instead, we now recognize that both seizures and developmental delays or regression are likely both symptoms of the underlying dysfunction and can affect each other by direction. So once again, bringing it back to the specific syndrome of lennox uh, the current, uh, these are the current treatment options um, that we have right now. Uh, and these are the current drugs which are in the uh, clinical trials for lennox -Gastaut. So specifically, fenfluramine is a medication that is, uh, has been approved most recently for lennox gasto and um, here is a brief information about it. Uh, initially used as an appetite suppressant. Um, its mechanism of action is that it has a high affinity for brain serotonin receptors and leads to high serotonin concentration. Um, the caution note about this is that in the past, with high doses, cardiac side effects have been noted specifically valvular hypertrophy, as well as pulmonary artery hypertension. Multiple studies uh, prior to approval have demonstrated that low-dose fenfluramine can be highly beneficial in children with refractory epilepsy, specifically those of a small group of children with Dravet syndrome. And this is a, these are results of the pivotal uh, randomized controlled trial uh, that in 2022 afforded fenfluramine approval for lenox gusto syndrome treatment. It was a multicenter double-blind trial with a parallel control group. Uh, it involved 263 patients uh, from two years of age to 35 with a confirmed diagnosis of lennox uh, with a severity of two or more drop seizures per week during the four-week baseline. Um, these patients were divided into, study subjects were divided into three equal study groups uh, with two doses of enfluramine of 0.7 mg per kg per day and 0.2 mg per kg per day as well as placebo. Trial lasted for two weeks and there was a 12 week follow up. And the primary endpoint was a percent change in drop seizure frequency. So the results showed that there was a dose dependent reduction in seizures in both confluorine groups. Uh, with 26 patients, 26% uh, of patients in the higher dose, 0.7 mg per kg uh, group, uh, reaching their 50% uh, seizure reduction, compared to only 14% uh, of patients in the lower dosing, 0.2 mg per kg group. Showing this again in graphic form, uh, here are the highlights on the right-hand side. Again, this was a dose-related response. 
Um, interestingly, the seizure type which showed the greatest reduction in this trial was uh, generalized tonic clonic seizures. Um, the most common side effects, side effects included decreased appetite, somnolence, and fatigue. Importantly, there were no cases of cardiac valvulopathy or pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, noted in this trial. And also, caregivers reported CGI in index improvement uh, as much improved or very much improved in up to 26% of patients uh, in the higher fenfluramine group. So again, it has been approved in the past year, which is a very welcome news for this uh, refractory population. For, it's approved for two years plus uh, in age. It has to be prescribed via a REMS program because of cardiac valvulopathy and uh, pulmonary artery hypertension risks. Um, because of that, there needs to be a baseline echocardiogram as well as surveillance. Echocardiograms are performed every six months. It's a solution as listed up above um, with a half-life uh, of the drug of 20 hours. Importantly, there are some CYP450 interactions to consider. It is metabolized by CYP1A2 and CYP2B6. Um, its metabolism is partially inhibited by steripental. And, and dosing, again, as listed up above, is, um, depends on whether this drug is administered alone or with steripental and clobazam. Switching to another very interesting drug, Ganexalone. So Ganexalone is actually a synthetic analog of allopregnenolone, which is a metabolite of progesterone. And therefore, it is a neurosteroid, uh, which is somewhat unique in our armamentarium of anti-seizure medications. It acts by upregulating GABAergic inhibitory system. Um, it provides positive elasteric modulation at a synaptic and extrasynaptic GABA-A receptor sites. Again, multiple studies have shown uh, promising results regarding genexone efficacy and, um, and various uh, seizure disorders. And several trials are currently ongoing. The, uh, the one for Lonex Gusto, uh, PCDH19, uh, female pediatric epilepsy, and also CDKL5 deficiency syndrome epilepsy. And actually, this latest trial has been completed um, successfully and provided approval for this drug for this rare syndrome. So just to review, CDKL5 deficiency syndrome is a rare X-linked developmental epileptic encephalopathy with a female predominance. Uh, the gene product uh, is needed for neuronal survival and proliferation as well as normal synaptic function. The disease mechanism is that it's a loss of function dominant negative mutation, often occurring de novo. The symptoms that a person with CDKL5 disease has uh, are likely infantile and neonatal onset seizures of various types, which are refractory to standard anti-seizure medication. And there are coexistent severe global developmental delays in minimal language development. So this pivotal trial was a double-blind, randomized placebo-controlled trial, amazingly concluded ac across eight countries. It involved 100 patients, with 79% of them being female. Importantly enough, uh, person needed to have a pathogenic or likely pathogenic CDKL5 variant in order to be included. Um, and the results, uh, the primary endpoint had to do with a median percentage reduction of major motor seizure frequency over roughly a one-month period. So again, Ganexalone result uh, produced a median seizure reduction of 30%, which was significantly statistically different from the placebo group. And the 50% responder rate for Ganexalone was 24% compared to 10% of placebo in the placebo group. There were some side effects seen, but they were equal in both the placebo and Ganexalone group. Uh, these included somnolence, pyrexia, and hypersalivation. So again, this is very exciting news for this uh, rather rare but severe uh, type of epilepsy and epileptic encephalopathy. If you see the dosing up above, um, it's been approved for patients two years of age and older. It is a, there's a caution where this should be regarding co-administration with moderate and strong inducers of CYP3A4. Um, and importantly, it's the first effective treatment uh, specifically for this um, epilepsy syndrome. Um, uh, and again, what's interesting is that it's the first instance of a neuroactive steroid demonstrating, demonstrating efficacy for the seizure, uh, for, as a seizure treatment. All right. We will very briefly talk about Gervais syndrome, which, um, again, is very refractory, um, as we all know. And it, as I mentioned already, it, it, it occurs in previously normally developing child uh, where multiple prolonged febrile and then afebrile seizures begin, generalized clonic and, importantly, hemiclonic. Uh, other seizure types emerge by four years of age, and around this time, also children uh, 
the seizures are refractory often from the beginning, and, uh, and children also develop cognitive, behavioral, and motor impairments over time. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a condition, as we know, with uh, multiple genetic causes, but by far the most common are the SCN1 mutations. Um, and these patients have increased risk of status epilepticus as well as early death due to pseudo. Um, there have been, uh, there have, we've been lucky in that uh, in the past several years, there have been several new medications added uh, to armamentarium for Dravet syndrome, specifically steripental, um, cannabidiol, and fenfluramine, uh, with uh, fenfluramine being most uh, recently. Um, so therefore, there is a proposed treatment paradigm, which is very helpful. Um, and we will move on. So steripental, we will briefly discuss. Uh, it was uh, first described in 1978. Um, Multiple uh, open-label studies have, uh, have shown its efficacy uh, and promise, and finally it was approved for as adjunctive therapy for Drave in Europe in 2007 and U.S. in 2018. Um, it has multiple, that, multiple mechanisms of action. Uh, two have been hypothesized um, as the most important that listed over there. Um, and it, does, uh, it, it is an efficacious medication, but it does come with some side effects, such as anorexia, drowsiness, and behavioral changes. Um, Again, patients uh, in the centuluramine higher group um, had a greater reduction in mean monthly convulsive seizure frequency as demonstrated on the slides. Uh, this is a similar dose-related uh, efficacy as we have seen in Lenox Augusto patient group as well. <clears throat> and because these are patients with very refractory seizures, uh, it, it was a very reasonable thing to look at the um, com combination therapy of centuluramine and stripental and whether that would give more efficacy. Indeed, this was the case. Um, so as you can see, uh, the curve for fenfluramine uh, together with steripental provided greater seizure reduction com uh, compared to um, the steripental regimen alone. All right. So now we will switch over to new therapies. And very quickly, I will talk about antisense oligonucleotides. Um, they have been in use for multiple rare diseases. And basically, ASO is a short single-strand nucleotide made to bind a complementary strand of messenger RNA in specific target region. ASOs can restore or silence RNA function at a specific mutation site. ASOs can also be used for some, uh, can be used for uh, either loss of function or gain of function mutations. Um, the first ASO therapies uh, were the FDA, were FDA approved in 2016 for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, as well as infantile onset SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. And then in 2019, a specific ASO developed for MCL type 7, the early childhood baton disease, demonstrated significant seizure reduction in one patient uh, as a proof of concept. Um, ASO overall is a promising technique for epileptic encephalopathy with known genetic mutation, with a known genetic mutation with a high seizure burden and where there is minimal efficacy of current anti-seizure medications. Um, there have been reports, uh, encouraging reports about the use of ASO in KCNT1 epileptic encephalopathy, uh, which is a very severe epilepsy. Uh, with, a, with multiple unremitting seizures um, and often early death by three years of age. Um, there have been uh, encouraging uh, animal trials and, and human trials are currently. Um, and there, was a, there was a small human trial of only three patients uh, reported just recently in the fall of this year where there was seizure reduction observed in two out of three patients. However, um, it, you know, two out of three of them developed hydrocephalus and unfortunately one of them died. So there, this trial was paused. Um, all right. ASO there also have been uh, looked into uh, as a therapy for Dravet syndrome, specifically for some of the gain of function mutations, which is a rare cause of uh, Dravet syndrome. Um, and the human trials for this are currently ongoing. Um, so there, is both, there are both promise and pitfalls of personalized medicine discovery. Um, KCNT1 specific ASO uh, has showed promise in a mouse model of the disease uh, where there was a primary endpoint of seizure reduction. Uh, KCNT1 ASO in human patients uh, gave us uh, so far very limited but uh, uh, somewhat conflicting data, um, and it requires intrathecal injection every two weeks, uh, which is invasive and labor intensive. And really, only three patients so far have been reported. Um, you know, we, they, they saw hydrocephalus as a side effect seen uh, in two out of three patients in this trial, and one of them dying. Uh, again, the numbers are too small to really generalize, um, but it, it, it both offers, offers promise and. Um, requires much larger trials to really understand the, the, the safety and efficacy of this potential treatment. And therefore, data sharing on efficacy and side effects of new technologies like ASO is truly essential when dealing with rare diseases that have um, a low power individual trials. And so with my last slide, I will try to give you just a few highlights of epilepsy genetics. Um, so 
Currently available diagnostic tools include, as we know, epilepsy panels, uh, whole exome sequencing, uh, where TRIO is much preferred, including both parents, as well as genome sequencing in certain places. It's useful to recall that single genome monogenic disorders account for just a minority of genetic pediatric um, epilepsies. Current successes include our uh, diagnostic yield when screening for causes of infantile epileptic encephalopathies uh, or DEs, so that definitely should be utilized early. And multiple challenges remain. One of them is understanding the phenotypic character um, or variability, why uh, one mutation can cause different phenotypes even within one family. The thoughts on their effects of modifier genes and environment and also epigenetic effects. Other challenges include interpretation of variants of unknown significance. Um, what constitutes a VUS uh, and what do we do with it? When do we analyze it? Um, another uh, important challenge is to understand all the wealth of data that we have been able to mine. Um, because at this point, um, you know, our current ability to identify genetic variants clearly outpaces our ability to fully interpret it um, and then take action upon it. So there was a very recent encouraging study um, to this effect uh, where there was a high throughput automatic patch clamp technique used to look at multiple 81 variants of KCMQ2 uh, the, uh, uh, abnormalities. Um, and, the, and these variants were studied uh, in, this, in this very high throughput manner in order to look for both the, examine their, their effect on, 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 on cell function, on, on, on the channel function, as well as what therapeutic uh, response they had to reticulate. So I think this is a very promising technique. Um, and again, this was done um, through the collaboration of multiple institutions. Um, and I think if we, have, if, if we use the similar techniques in the future, they will, they, they, they will really answer a lot of our questions. All right. And here are the conclusions. So developmental epileptic encephalopathies remain as the most challenging group of pediatric epilepsy to treat successfully. And while frequent seizures consistently worsen developmental prognosis, the causal relationship between seizures and onset of encephalopathy is not, still not very well understood. Fenfluramin is a new drug approved for anoscosal syndrome. Ganaxlone is a new agent approved for CDKL5 deficiency disorder. Antisense oligonucleotides show early promise for treatment of Dravet and, uh, syndrome and KCNT1 and hold promise probably for many other rare diseases as well. Um, early genetic testing should be a standard of care for any severe epilepsy of childhood. Um, and progress, much progress is needed to improve our understanding of genotype phenotype correlations for epilepsy variants. Thank you very much. And I think now I have my question. So which of the following anti-seizure drugs is a neurosteroid acting by allosteric modulation of GABA-A receptors? A, steripental, B, fenfluramine, C, parampanil, D, ganexalum. All right, so the answer is D, ganaxalone. Ganaxalone is unique among anti-seizure medication by virtue of being a neurosteroid, a synthetic analog of allopregnanolone and metabolite of progesterone. It enhances GABA transmission by positive allosteric modulation of GABA-A receptor. Ganaxalone has been FDA approved in 2022 for treatment of seizures in CDKL5 deficiency epilepsy. And the clinical trial of ganaxalone for treatment of seizures in lennox gastel syndrome is currently ongoing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Romansova. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Cesar uh, Ochoa Lubinov. Dr. Ochoa is a board certified developmental behavioral pediatrician uh, and associate professor and division chief of developmental behavioral pediatrics at Rush University Medical Center. Dr. Ochoa has established a multidisciplinary developmental behavioral pediatrics clinical program at Rush University that evaluates and provides specialized follow up care including psychopharmacological management to children and adolescents with autism spectrum disorders, attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, Down syndrome, Angelman syndrome, 
and many other complex neurodevelopmental conditions. He is also the co-director of the Rush Angelman Syndrome Clinic. Dr. Ochoa has been an investigator in clinical trials for autism, Angelman Syndrome, Down Syndrome, and Fragile X. In addition, he uh, serves as a medical consultant for the Illinois Early Intervention System. Dr. Ochoa. Today, I will be talking about assessment of autism spectrum disorders. The, the objectives of this presentation include uh, discuss the biological basis of autism, review the autism clinical presentation, DSM-5 diagnostic criteria and diagnostic process, expand the understanding of autism genetic mechanisms, and uh, discuss the benefits of genetic testing in individuals with autism. Um, the prevalence of autism has been increasing in the last 30 years. And uh, as of 2020, the CDC brought it up to one in 54 or 1.8%. The, the causes for this increase are the um, major, major um, increase in uh, professional and public awareness. There are more objective um, diagnostic criteria and more functional, uh, like the DSM-5, and that the one that is in DSM-5. Um, there's also um, better tools, more objective tools to diagnose autism, like the ADOS, and there are more teams that are um, trained to diagnose autism. Something that also, also should be mentioned is that the, um, the, um, the borders of the spectrum of autism has ex have expanded, and now there are individuals that have milder forms of autism that are diagnosed, that probably were not diagnosed 30 years ago, and also in individuals with intellectual disabilities um, that were not diagnosed before now sometimes get this diagnosis of autism. Um, what is autism? Autism spectrum disorder is a heterogeneous neuro neurodevelopmental disorder, mainly characterized by uh, two sets of symptoms. One set of symptoms is um, impaired social interactions and the other restricted repetitive patterns of interest and behaviors. Uh, autism results from early altered brain development and neural reorganization. So there's something in the brain that is different in individuals with autism and it's at the um, connections level. Uh, there are no reliable biomarkers, so we don't have a test that can help us diagnose autism. The diagnosis must be made on the basis of behavioral observations. So this slide shows the brain wiring in autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, in neurotypical individuals, uh, you can see uh, the connections at the local level between neurons and also the long distance level connections uh, between neurons. Individuals with intellectual disabilities have the same connections, but they are less, they are more scattered and they are weaker. And in individuals with autism, you can see that the local uh, neuron connections are stronger, while the um, long distance connections are uh, weaker and more scattered uh, compared with neurotypical individuals. Um, this might be the reason individuals with autism have a tendency to fixate in details, but have a hard time integrating or getting a, the big picture of this uh, information. So this is a busy slide that tries to show different lines of um, evidence for the biological basis of autism. At the pathology level, um, you can see that the brain size of uh, newborns that are going to have autism um, is larger. But over time, it tends to um, you know, become more like the typical size. Uh, by the time they are adolescents, usually the brain size is similar. Um, the cortical columns of individuals with autism are much more disorganized. Um, at the systems level, we can see, we already saw the slide before about the um, connectivity in the brain in individuals with autism. Um, there's evidence that shows that um, individuals uh, with autism have an excess of the um, excitatory neurotransmitters, like the ones we're showing here, compared to neurotypical individuals. Many of the um, uh, targeted brain treatments that are being investigated for autism are based on this and try to balance the excitatory neurotransmission in individuals with autism. Um, at the cellular and molecular level, we have hundreds of genes that have been implicated in the etiology of autism. Um, there, um, there are apparently these, these hundreds of genes are going to go into some uh, discrete number of um, common cellular pathways. So far, uh, the activity-dependent protein synthesis, neuronal activity, and uh, neuronal cell adhesion are the main um, pathways that lead um, to autism. Um, in 1943, uh, Dr. Leo Kanner in, in the US described uh, a group of boys and girls that had uh, different social connectedness that were very self-directed, did not communicate uh, 
effectively verbally and engage in self-stimulatory behaviors like uh, stereotype movements. Uh, one year later, in 1944, uh, Dr. Uh, Asperger in uh, Vienna, Austria, described a small number of um, boys that uh, spoke on time and uh, rapidly developed a large vocabulary uh, and spoke like uh, little adults. Uh, but these individuals had significant difficulties regulating social interactions and their behavior. Um, as you know, uh, DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual from the American Academy of Psychiatry that classifies the uh, mental health conditions. So um, in 1952, the first DSM, and in 1968, the DSM-2, uh, talk about autistic symptoms, but under the umbrella of schizophrenia. Uh, it is only in 1980 with the DSM-3 that the concept of infantile autism came up. Um, in uh, 1994, there was the DSM-4 that um, talked about Asperger uh, syndrome, uh, classic autism, and PDD. And um, in, since 2013, we have the DSM-5 that talks about autism spectrum disorders. Um, like we said before, autism is um, a group of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, characterized by social uh, deficits and restricted repetitive patterns of interest and behavior. We think that there are categories in this condition, but um, at this time we don't have enough evidence to, uh, to do science-based categories. And uh, so that the decision at this time is everyone is going to be called autism spectrum disorder and it's going to be described depending on their cognitive abilities, their language abilities, and the presence of mental health comorbidities. Um, so in DSM-4, um, autism was conceived as a condition with deficits in communication, social interaction, and restricted and repetitive behaviors. The DSM-5, the current um, classification and diagnostic criteria of autism, only considers two set of symptoms, social communication deficits and restricted repetitive uh, patterns of interest and behavior. Um, within the social communication symptoms, there are three criteria, and the three criteria must be met in order to have a diagnosis of autism. And um, the first one is, um, uh, individuals with autism have uh, deficits interacting um, um, with other people, don't understand uh, the social uh, nature of interactions, and, and have significant difficulties with the social connectedness. They don't have the social drive that you um, would expect in a typically developing uh, person. Second, um, they uh, have limited use of nonverbal means for social interactions, like eye contact, gestures, expressions. And, and thirdly, um, they um, have significant difficulties developing relationships, social relationships that are appropriate for their developmental level. So um, in order to meet criteria for autism, an individual needs to have these three social communication deficits, but that is not enough to have uh, the diagnosis of autism. In addition, they must have at least two out of four restricted repetitive patterns of interest and behavior. And uh, these four are first, um, individuals with autism tend to be fixated or obsessed uh, about certain um, interests. Like, you know, oftentimes uh, young children with autism are fixated in letters, numbers. They sometimes re learn to read very early because of this um, restricted, strong interest. Um, secondly, individuals with autism have this insistence for sameness. Um, they have this, um, once they figure out how to do something in a certain way, want to keep doing it the same way over and over. And if you change things for them, they struggle. So that's the insistence of sameness. Thirdly, individuals with autism have, um, initial uh, stereotype motor mannerisms like arm flapping, hand flapping, uh, rocking of their body. Um, and fourth, um, individuals with autism have initial sensory um, interests. Like for instance, some individuals with autism like to spin things and are very fixated on spinning and looking at things, or they like to look at the lights, or um, they may look at things closely, or they may um, kind of steam with the back of their eye looking at things. Um, so these are the DSM-5 criteria. I wanted to dedicate a, a slide for the early identification of children with autism. That's a goal, and it's, it's really important because, you know, um, the brain of young children has this plasticity. So if you do stimulation, if you do therapies to these young children, the potential for improvement is much larger. And you cannot just help these children improve in the short term, but also you are gonna be improving the long-term outcomes. So it's very important to do an early diagnosis. And uh, in pediatrics, um, the, the, the physicians, the primary care physicians are encouraged to do developmental screening, not just for autism, but in general for developmental delays, and to do 
autism screening using this tool, the MCHAT, which is a questionnaire with 22 questions that asks about symptoms of autism. These screening tools are gonna tell you about risk for autism, are not going to be diagnostic, but they're gonna tell you that there's a chance that this child may need autism and needs an evaluation. And what do you do when you screen kids with developmental delays or with autism? You wanna refer them to early intervention. Early, the early intervention system is a federally funded program that is administered differently in each state, but pretty much it's uh, for children from zero to three years of age that have developmental delays. And uh, once these children are identified and, and are considered to meet the developmental delay criteria to get services, they are going to receive these services in their natural home environment or in the daycare. And ideally the services are gonna be giving, are gonna be family centered to teach um, the parents to stimulate this child during daily life activities. And you know, this is a really good program. And you know, when you identify a child with developmental delays, this child needs to go to early intervention. Um, in Illinois, uh, early intervention have these medical diagnostic teams, they pay for these evaluations that can diagnose autism at an early age. Um, so um, how do we do the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders? Um, the first step is to get a history, um, to get a history of the developmental milestones, the developmental functioning, and what's the trajectory of the different um, developmental milestones over time. Uh, in research, there's this IDIR that is used as the gold standard for research, but in, in clinical practice, this is too long. There are other tools that can be used, but most people, you know, they develop their own template and get their own history. Something that is really important when you are diagnosing autism is to have a sense of what's the developmental or IQ level of the patient that you are evaluating. So, um, because it's not the same to diagnose, uh, to interpret the social communication deficit in a kid that has three years of age, but has a developmental age of 12 months, versus a kid that has three years of age and has a developmental age of three years. You're gonna interpret things differently. So that's important. And um, the gold standard to diagnose autism is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule or ADOS. What's the ADOS? It's, um, it's a standardized test uh, based uh, on play where you are going to elicit social um, symptoms in a child. Um, you're gonna elicit social symptoms in a child um, and uh, the evaluator who has been trained is going to take notes of the responses of the child in an evaluation. And um, is going to, at the end of the evaluation, is gonna give a score to this child that is gonna put in or outside of the spectrum. There are, uh, for um, ADOS, there are module one, two, and three for kids that are nonverbal or speak single words, for kids that speak in phrases or, speak, or kids that speak in sentences or are fluent speakers. There's a module for adults and a module for children under 30 months of age. Something I wanna say is the ADOS is not like, um, you know, there are some false positives and false negatives. There's a little bit of subjectivity and uh, children that have mild autism and are very smart can go under the radar in the ADOS, can have a false negative. And individuals that have cognitive disabilities uh, may have false positives. So it's really important that a person that has expertise in autism is interpreting all this information. Uh, a, a concept that is really important about autism is autism heterogeneity. So individuals with autism look very different from each other. And that depends on their IQ level, the language level, the severity of autism, their moral skills, the presence of psychiatric conditions and the, their own trajectories. So this um, PhD special education doctor, Dr. Stephen Shore, who happens to have autism, uh, coined this phrase that I think is very helpful. If you have met one person with autism, you have met one person with autism. So autism is not a final medical diagnosis. We're not done with a diagnosis of autism. We must order genetic test, testing to try to look for the cause of autism. So the, um, the clinical heritability in autism uh, become more evident in the 90s when there were a series of twin, identical twins and fraternal twin studies. Um, it was found that the concordance rate for autism in identical twins was 70 to 90%. And for fraternal twins was anywhere from zero to 31%. And at this time, uh, the risk for having a second child with autism uh, which is a common question when parents, uh, when you bring the news about autism, is up to 20%. And if you have two children with autism, the risk for having a third child with autism goes up to 50%. So um, a large population study with 3.5 million children in Sweden showed that the genetic contribution to autism is 80%. But again, it's not just purely autism, purely genetic. We also need environmental factors, which we don't understand very well yet. But uh, we know that there are environmental factors that are gonna interact with the genes to activate them. 
uh, and to cause or not cause autism. So um, even though autism is a condition that has an 80% heritability or genetic, still the, the yield of genetic testing is 10 to 20%, still very low because you know, the, the genetics of autism is very complex. Um, so, um, so usually you know, uh, I tell these to families ahead of genetic testing to limit their expectations about what's gonna come up. Still it's worth to order genetic testing. Something that we also uh, need to keep in mind is that you know, there are hundreds of genes that have been associated with the causing autism, but each gene variant doesn't cause more than 1% of the cases of autism. Actually, Fragile X might be the one that has almost 2% of the cases of autism, but the others don't go more than 1%. Um, human beings harbor 3 million genetic variants, and uh, there are some common variants that are um, shared with 5% of the population. And there are some rare variants that are rare or unique to um, one individual and their family. Um, when you think about genetic transmission, you think that this, this is a condition that is passed from uh, parents to children, but there are some um, de novo mutations. And uh, it has been found, which is, you know, the genetic variant uh, occurs, the genetic um, change, the genetic mutation occurs during fertilization. Um, 20 to 30 percent of individuals with autism have the novel changes in genes that are linked to autism. So I think this is a very important concept to keep in mind. Um, there are two paths for genetic transmission of autism, and I think um, there are two theories about paths of genetic transmission in autism. One is through common genetic variants. The, these are relatively high frequency genes that are responsible for just small risk for autism which happens in an important proportion of individuals with autism. Usually these individuals don't have much of an impact cognitively and don't have dysmorphic features. But uh, these individuals may need up to five hits of lower risk genes to cause the autism. On the other hand, we have the rare inherited alleles and autism. So these are um, genes that are not common, that are rather rare, and um, sometimes can be transmitted by parents or sometimes can happen like a, um, de novo um, genetic variation, and they, they account for 10 to 20% of cases of autism. So um, I, I'm gonna talk about uh, a CAP model, which is a novel tool to portray the complex genetic etiology of autism. Um, so in this, in this model, each individual has a CAP. Uh, and then we have uh, three different types of balls. The green ones are um, the common variants, the weaker genetic factors, um, then we have the, the, the blue balls that are the rare um, genes that give a strong um, risk for autism. And then we have the orange ones that are environmental factors, which are small. So if, if, if the balls fill the cap, don't fill the cap, then um, there's no autism. But if the threshold is rich and the balls fill the cap, then uh, the individual has autism. So let's, let's talk now about um, like a farm ball. Then we have a family, we have the, the father who has, um, um, one, um, one common variant um, with low risk for autism and three environmental factors. And on the other hand, we have the man that has um, one, um, one rare variant with a lot of risk for autism, one common variant with small risk for autism and one environmental factor. So, but this rare variant is not big enough to fill the, the gap. So this man doesn't have autism and the father doesn't have autism, but then they have a child who inherits the, the, the rare variant from mom and gets the common variant uh, from dad, from mom, and one de novo uh, common variant. So in this kid, um, the cap is filled, the threshold is rich, and this child one has autism. Then we have child two who gets only one common variant uh, with low risk, um, and this, this child is not gonna have autism and is, uh, is not gonna carry autism for um, his or her children. Then we have child three who functions a little bit like mom in that, um, got the rare variant that didn't reach the threshold, so he's not gonna have autism, but like her mom is gonna carry this uh, high-risk gene for autism, and she may have kids with autism, unlike child two. And finally, we have child four, who has um, a very large, larger than A, uh, rare variant that has a lot of risk for autism, but it's a de novo uh, mutation. And, and this individual is gonna have autism, but interestingly, probably this child four is gonna, even though it has the same diagnosis and child one, is gonna look very different because they have different genetic variants. Um, a concept that is important to, to, to keep in mind for autism is that uh, autism has been considered more like a male condition. Uh, historically, uh, a 4.5 over one 
male to female ratio, although more recent studies show that it might be more like three to one. Uh, and it seems like a lot of females go under the radar for autism because they have a tendency to have um, less, uh, they, they can compensate in social deficits on one hand, and on the other hand, the restricted repetitive patterns of interest and behavior are more, uh, are less atypical, less unusual. So they, they don't get recognized as, as readily as, as males. And, and people tend to think about autism uh, in males, but not as much in females. And also it appears that uh, females require a higher genetic load of risk uh, to develop autism. So, um, so in order to, to explain that, uh, the, the people that designed this, this model, this cup model, decided to, to build a larger cup uh, for females. So they need more um, genetic risk factors to, to reach the threshold. Um, and I also wanna, this is a busy slide, but I want you to focus in this picture. Uh, there's a genetic variant uh, to ASTN2, which is a rare variant. Um, so it gives a lot of risk, uh, but this variant doesn't just give risk for autism, but also for OCD and ADHD. And I think it's important to, to think about autism as a part of a continuum of the neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and that uh, the genes that give risk for autism may also give risk for other conditions like intellectual disabilities, epilepsy, um, ADHD, OCD. And, and that might be the reason uh, when you look at um, autism uh, people, uh, you can see that there's a high prevalence of uh, comorbidities because their genes that cause autism also give risk for these other conditions. There's a um, high risk of intellectual disabilities, epilepsy, and all, all this. So um, this, um, this is a slide that can help you uh, explain families and can also deal with insurance companies. Why is genetic testing um, important for autism? Having a, a, a cause, a, a gene variant that can explain the diagnosis can give diagnostic clarity to families and, and to all of us. Um, when you identify what is it, the gene variant that causes autism, you can, um, you can look at the literature and try to understand what are the trajectories of those individuals with that genetic variant and use that information to estimate the developmental trajectory of your particular patient. You can do genetic counseling about future risk of other children with autism. Um, some genetic variants are um, associated with some medical problems. So, um, you know, having the um, identifying a gene variant can tell you about uh, medical vulnerabilities and also having a more biological diagnosis can help appropriate allocation of supports and services. So uh, finally, I am going to talk about, I'm gonna bring up my question. Um, when discussing the genetic assessment of a pediatric patient with a new diagnosis of autism, which of these is the most appropriate statement you may wanna discuss with your patient's parents? A, the 70-80% concordance rate for autism in monozygotic twins supports the multifactorial model with both genetic and environmental factors. At this time, the yield of genetic, genetic testing in patients with autism is only 10 to 20%. De novo mutations are estimated to account for the etiology in 20 to 30% of the autism cases. D, identifying the genetic cause of, of autism will allow uh, to assess the recurrence risk of autism, as well as to estimate developmental trajectories and identify medical vulnerabilities when comparing with individuals with the same genetic variant. E, all of the above. The answer is E. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ochoa. Our next speaker, or our last speaker of the session is Dr. Elizabeth Barry Kravis. Uh, Dr. Kra Barry Kravis is a professor of pediatrics and neurological sciences at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. She established the Fragile X Clinic and Research Program in 1991 through which she has provided care to over 700 patients with Fragile X syndrome. 
She has studied medical issues, epilepsy, and psychopharmacology in Fragile X, and has been a leader in translational research in Fragile X uh, syndrome for uh, 20 years, including development of clinical outcome measures and biomarkers, natural history studies, newborn screening, and particularly clinical trials of new targeted treatments in Fragile X syndrome, for which he has been a PI or co-PI uh, of 25 trials. Her laboratory studies the cellular role of Fragile X mental retardation protein and optimization of gen genetic testing methods. More recently, she has expanded clinical and translational work to other neurodevelopmental disorders in addition to Fragile X syndrome, including autism spectrum disorders and single gene models of autism spectrum disorders, including Phelan McDermott syndrome, Rett syndrome, and Angelman syndrome. She's also working on translational research in rare neurogenetic disorders, including Neiman Pick type C, Batten's disease, panto, uh, pantothenate uh, kinase associated neurodegeneration, and creatine transporter deficiency. She's on advisory and or review boards for multiple foundations, including the FRAXA Research Foundation, National Fragile X Foundation, Phelan McDermott Syndrome Foundation, International Rett Syndrome Foundation, Angel Angelman Syndrome Foundation, Foundation for Angelman Syndrome Therapeutics, Combined Brain, and N equal one collaborative, as well as the Gather Foundation. She has received multiple awards, including the NFXF Jarrett Cole Clinical Award, the FRAXA Champion Award, NFXF William and Enid Rosen Research Award, March of Dimes Jonas Salk Award, Research Award, the American Academy of Neurology Sydney Carter Award in Child Neurology, John Merck Fund Spark Plug Award, and the inaugural Martha Bridge Denkla Award from the Child Neurology Society for her work in cognitive disorders of children. Dr. Barry Kravis. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about advances in pediatric neurology in recent years where we've been able to capitalize on many of the advances in basic science to treat previously untreatable diseases in pediatric neurology. Um, and so rare disease in child neurology, actually, we see a lot of rare diseases. So taken together, they're not so rare. And these were frequently undiagnosed in our clinics in the past. But now the causes are being discovered and diagnosed due to um, advances in testing, including whole exome sequencing, microarrays, better metabolic assays, whole genome sequence, and RNA-seq. And once these patients are diagnosed, the next step is how do we treat them? And the current explosion of genetic and molecular and cellular strategies for treating these conditions, uh, which has also been fueled by advances in chemistry and molecular technology, is actually allowing treatment of some of these conditions. And so strategies in play or close to um, being available in clinic are things like use of antisense oligonucleotides, gene therapy, DNA and RNA editing through CRISPR, enhancers of specific forms of synaptic connectivity, enzyme and protein replacement, substrate reduction or transport enhancement, and even X chromosome activation. And so what I'm going to do today is show five examples of these strategies that are or are impacting disease currently or are being evaluated through clinical trials for an impact on, on disease. Um, so spinal muscular atrophy is the first disease I'm going to talk about, and it's probably been the picture disease for use of genetic strategies to change the disease. Um, and this is a condition of severe weakness from birth based on loss of anterior horn cells, occurs in about 1 in 10,000 patients, is, and is one of the most common, was in the past, one of the most common causes of early childhood death. Um, Patients with SMA1 don't sit or walk, and most die or have to go on permanent respiratory support by two years. Patients with SMA2 are weak, but they can sit and often live into their 20s or 30s. SMA3 and 4, the patients are weak but stand, and this is quite variable in terms of manifestations and, the, and disability and the lifespan may be normal. SMA is caused by a defect in the SMN1 gene, which is either deleted or converted to SMN2, or there's a mutation in the gene leading to absent SMN protein. 
SMN2 is a copy gene that's very similar to SMN1 and only has a few nucleotides different, but those nucleotide differences cause it to splice out exon 7 of the gene and make an incomplete protein, but some normal SMN slips through from SMN2. So whether a patient has SMN1, 2, or 3, 4 depends on how many SMN2 copy genes they have. For SMA1, usually there are two copy genes, SMA2, three copy genes, and SMA3 and 4, four or more copy genes. So under Understanding this basic genetics led to a treatment strategy. So here we have the picture of um, the normal situation where we have SMN1 making the normal SMN protein and SMN2 making mostly the abnormal protein that doesn't work and a little bit of a normal protein. And when we have SMA, SMN1 is mutated or deleted or not working. And so we have SMN2 making a little bit of a normal protein. Um, but what if we had an antisense oligonucleotide that could block a splice enhancer site and alter this so that SMN2 would actually make more of the normal protein? And in fact, that was what was created. And it turned out that this um, ASO was able to increase the amount of SMN production in the SMA mouse quite a bit. And then a clinical trial was run in humans with this ASO and the phase two clinical trial results showed actually death was the outcome in a questionably ethical trial um, where there was a sham group. And so the sham group after, six, after a six month interim analysis was showing a higher rate of death than the treated group. And therefore the drug was approved by the FDA under Spinraza um, through Ionis and Biogen um, in 2016. And so this is an, the antisense oligonucleotides are delivered by LP infusion. And just for some examples of how this can change, the power of understanding genetics has changed SMA. This is just a video of a patient, of a family. This family has three kids with SMA. Their first one died at about age four. This is, a, this is their second one at age six, and he's on ventilatory support and can't move. Um, this is their second child. This is their third child who was diagnosed in utero with SMA. And as you can see, she can walk around and has quite a bit of motor skill that no one with SMA1 really ever develops. And here's just another um, video of her um, showing that she can run. Um, and so I think this is particularly um, kind of poignant video of the power of molecular genetics where we see the impaired child who can't move holding hands with the child who can now walk because of a genetic treatment. Um, Okay. Um, so, um, but there are several other strategies that have been approved for SMA as well. Um, there's a small molecule that alters splicing that Roche created, um, Evrisd or Rizdeplam, and that was approved by the FDA in August of 2020. And then a gene therapy, Zolgensma, was approved by the FDA in 2019 after a natural history controlled trial. And SMA has been kind of low hanging fruit for CNS delivery of, uh, of a genetic therapy because you only have to get the drug to the spinal cord and not into the brain. Um, and what we've learned from SMA is that key is early treatment and patients like the one I showed you walking can be close to normal. Um, and so newborn screening was for SMA was recommended by the RUSP um, several years ago. Um, and so for many patients, the treatment is not complete because they start treatment too late or, they, or, or it doesn't work perfectly and makes SMA1 into SMA2, SMA3 or SMA2 if treatment is started a little bit later. So combinations may actually be more effective as these different molecules like the gene versus the ASO may get into different neurons and the treatments may be additive. And these combination trials are going on now. And I believe combination therapy will be the story of the future in genetic diseases and pediatric neurology as we get more and more of these genetic treatments available. So the second condition I'm going to talk about is late infantile Batten's disease, late, also called late infantile neuronal steroid lipofusionosis, or CLN2 more recently. And this is a rapidly progressive fatal genetic autosomal recessive neurodegenerative lysosomal storage disease. It is one of the more common lysosomal storage diseases in the USA and about one in 200,000. It starts at around age two to four with mild developmental delays emerging, then speech delay, then seizure, seizures begin an increase in frequency, and the patient usually basically loses has rapid neurodegeneration and loses all skills typically in less than two years. And this is due to a tripeptidyl peptidase deficiency in the lysosome, which causes storage of lipoprotein in the lysosome and neural cell dysfunction. This is just a little video to show you how fat, oops. 
to show how fast this disease goes. Um, so this is a family that has um, the boy in the video, four, and his sister's like two, and he's running around here, see? Um, he's got a little bit of on his toes, but other than that, he doesn't have much neurological signs. Fast forward a half a year, he started having seizures, and this is his functioning by about four and a half. And then fast forward a year and a half more, and by six, he basically looks like this. Um, so this is a very rapid neurodegeneration um, in need of a treatment. Um, and in fact, um, research in the basic science lab showed that you could actually inject the TPP1 enzyme into the ventricles and it would actually get taken up into the neurons and go into the brain and correct degeneration in the CLN2 mouse and dog. And so again, a phase one clinical trial was run where it was shown that in 25 patients, there was practically no decline in the CLN2 rating scale for motor and language, whereas in natural history, these patients declined very rapidly over a year or two. And so the drug was approved actually based on a phase one trial versus natural history because even the FDA, FDA realized it would be unethical to run a controlled trial in this situation. So this enzyme is delivered through an infusion into a port over four hours. It slows or stops disease. It slows or stops disease progression, but you don't get function back. So in order to have the best effect, you need to treat early. And so we want to diagnose these kids as soon as a there's a suggestion of developmental delay or at their first seizure. And in fact, the company Biomarin sponsors with NVTA a behind the seizure program where you can get an epilepsy genetic panel free from NVTA for anyone with new onset seizures age eight or less, and then you can find this disease early, so don't be the doctor that misses it. This is the link to the NVTA behind the seizure program. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about neiman pick type C, which is also a recessive neurovisceral vis visceral degenerative disorder um, with a much more variable onset than CLN2. The onset age ranges from the perinatal period to age 40, and these patients have a broad spectrum of different clinical manifestations. Um, and their neurological problems are really their biggest issue, but can present in all kinds of different ways. Um, and these patients are so different, they're almost like individual N of one patients, making it very hard to run clinical trials. Um, in this disease, cholesterol and multiple, multiple other lipids accumulate in the lysosome because of a mutation in NPC1 or NPC2, which work together to transport cholesterol out of the lysosome, and the absence leads to these deficits of intracellular traffic, trafficking. And so the cholesterol gets stuck in the lysosome where it causes toxicity, and there's a deficiency of cholesterol in the rest of the cell, which results in, a, in basically a deficiency syndrome. The treatment, there's a treatment called Miglostat, which is a substrate re reducer that decreases the amount of glucosal ceramide produced um, and decreases the storage a little bit and slows the disease the disease progression a little bit, but does not stop the disease. This is approved everywhere outside the, the USA because the FDA wouldn't approve it. Um, and there's a drug called cyclodextrin um, in development for the past nine years here in the USA. And cyclodextrin is kind of an interesting story. The FDA approved this as an excipient to dissolve steroids for IV infusions. So it's been used in many, many people in IV infusions of steroids. Um, but intrathecally, when it was administered, to um, animal models, it reversed symptoms and it substantially extended life in the mouse and cat with MPC and this circular molecule that somehow gets into the cell and um, basically bypasses the, trans the, the transport, the MPC1 and MPC2 tra transport proteins and pulls the cholesterol out of the lysosome. So a phase one, two trial showed slowing of disease on a disease scale called the MPC severity scale versus natural history matched controls. And in a phase two trial, unfortunately, this was a one-year sham controlled trial um, dictated by the FDA, um, which showed no benefit due to unequal randomization and no progression in the sham arm, although the treated arm didn't progress either. So there was basically no way to show in the trial that the drug was, whether the drug was having an effect. But we've run an expanded access program here at Rush for the past nine years, and I have a compassionate use protocol, which because of the failure of the trial, now all patients in the USA are treated through this. 
And we've collected quite a bit of data in this very, very long expanded access program. These are our treated patients down here. When we compare their progression to five different natural history groups that are published, we see their progression overall is less than these other natural history groups. We've done a case control study for the early onset kids that were treated before age five. And this is the a time to progression analysis with deteriorating two points per year on the MPC severity scale. And our patients are here, whereas natural history controls that were carefully matched are here. So even after um, a, a, a short time of follow-up, we have a highly significant p-value for a longer time to progression for the treated patients. And 100% of the controls progress in four years, but only 29% of the treated patients. We also can show that we pull 24-hydroxy cholesterol, which is only made in neurons, um, out of the cells. And that ha we, we, can, we can show this increases in CSF after the treatment with cyclodextrin. And essentially, the cholesterol has to be pulled out of the lysosome and converted to 24-hydroxy cholesterol for that to happen. So this is a primary disease activity biomarker showing we are reversing the mechanism of disease. And then we've also done a big analysis on our EAP patients um, and the trial patients together where we looked at their progression before they were followed and then looked at progression in natural history versus progression after they were treated. And it turns out that progression rate goes up in natural history because the pre-treatment um, pre progression is, is um, averaged from birth and patients don't really start progressing at birth, whereas the, the treated patients have a rate of progression that goes down um, and therefore um, suggesting we are slowing progression. And then this is just a video of two kids. Again, the power of early treatment in NPC. These kids are both six years and 10 months. The patient here is untreated. Um, the patient here was treated at age two because she was diagnosed early due to her sister. And this is them. I think you'll be able to see the difference in how they can walk across the yard at age six. So again, the power of treating early in these degenerative diseases. And so studies in, in diseases like Neiman Pick and um, Batten's disease have shown us that we're gonna get a different kind of response depending on when we treat the patient. If this is the patient's degenerative course, if we treat early and we're gonna have a range of responses, we may see slight improvement to, to um, mild progression. If we treat in the middle of the disease, the best we probably can do is stabilize the disease versus slowing progression. And if we treat late, we may not even be able to slow progression or we may slow it some. And this is because after the neurodegeneration gets going, there are many aberrant processes like inflammation, negative cellular processes that get set in motion. So degeneration now depends not just on the primary mechanism as it does early on, but on all these other processes that are going on in the neural cells. So late treatment is not very effective. And this has been clearly demonstrated demonstrated in multiple forms of Batten's disease. And what we want is to be able to treat the patient before they start disease. The genetic disease actually begins at birth when the clinical sign, by the time you see clinical signs, many of the neurons have died and reserve is exhausted. So we want to intervene before um, so that we can have the most impactful outcome and keep the patients normal and functional. And we need newborn screening for that. Um, okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about Fragile X syndrome, and this is a condition with some mild dysmorphisms that aren't always present. Um, average IQ of 40 to 50. Um, they have coordination and praxis deficits, as well as very limiting behaviors, and about half have autism spectrum disorder, and they have a little bit of increase in some medical issues, but this is not the real problem. The big problem is behavior and cognition. Um, we have supportive medications for behavior, but uh, as you can see from this, only the green people have their medications working a lot. So we have a clearly an unmet need for better behavioral treatments and any kind of cognitive treatments. So we want to treat the underlying disorder. So what is the underlying disorder in Fragile X? Well, Fragile X is caused by a more than 200 repeat CGG expansion mutation in the promoter of fMR1, which shuts down the gene with loss or reduction of fMRP. fMRP regulates synaptic protein synthesis of many important synaptic proteins. And one of the things that's abnormal in it in the neurons of people with fragile X is their cyclic AMP signaling, which is an important signal transduction system in neurons, is reduced when they don't have fMRP. And this is actually work that I did very early in my career that shows this cyclic AMP signaling is reduced in platelets from patients with fragile X relative to controls. And then when we overexpress in neurons more fMRP, 
here we can see that the cyclic AMP goes up, so fMRP is regulating it, and then work from an Anita Bhattacharya's lab that shows that cyclic AMP is reduced in the mouse brain and stem cells um, with Fragile X. But there's been no drug to target this for over 25 years until improved chemistry allowed the production of a brain-specific phosphodiesterase 4D inhibitor, which um, can decrease the cyclic AMP degradation and therefore increase levels in brain and in fact normalizes levels of cyclic AMP in brain um, and reverses multiple phenotypes in the Fragile X mouse. So we did an early phase two trial with this molecule about starting about two years ago. And this is the first ever phase two trial in Fragile X to improve cognition on a iPad-based measure called the NIH toolbox that we have validated and modified for intellectual disability, um, on parent report of functioning and language and daily functioning, and on several um, EEG biomarkers of Fragile X. So this is a very exciting finding of a drug that impacts neural connectivity, and phase three study is in progress for this drug. Um, Angelman syndrome is the last specific condition I'm going to talk about. This is a condition with severe intellectual disability with expressive language most affected, and pa many patients are nonverbal. Development after age four, as you can see from these plots of the Bailey and Angelman syndrome, is very slow, and they make very little developmental progress after age four. Um, they have very delayed motor skills, ataxia, tremor, a happy, a happy affect and laughing spells, seizure, sleep problems, and various behavior problems that often come from excessive sociability and hyperexcitability, and then there are variable dysmorphic features. The genetics of Angelman syndrome is that it results from a defect of maternal UBE3A on chromosome 15, and this is an imprinted gene in brain such that only the paternally, such the paternally derived UBE3A is shut down and only the maternal gene is expressed in brain. And so one can have different deficits in the maternal gene, like a deletion mutation, or two paternal chromosome 15s, or an imprinting center mutation that makes the maternal gene behave like the paternal gene, um, and have Angelman syndrome. But knowing this mechanism allows us to try to understand, well, why is the paternal gene shut down? Well, the paternal gene is shut down because there's an antisense transcript on the paternal chromosome that's active, which is not active on the maternal chromosome, that, that actually is transcribed in the reverse direction and blocks the UBE3A gene. So in Angelman syndrome, when we don't have the maternal UBE3A active, and the paternal UBE3A is blocked by the antisense transcript, we have no UBE3A, and hence the neurological syndrome. Um, but if we had an antisense oligonucleotide, which blocked this antisense transcript from being transcribed, then the paternal gene would become active. And it turns out this actually works quite well in the, in the Angelman mouse. We can make the UBE3A protein, and we can see the antisense transcript being decreased. And then we can see in brain, here and here, expression of UBE3A in neurons when we use the ASO. Um, so this is now in trials for humans. There are three companies running the trial, and have they, bought, they all have phase 1, 2A trials of the ASO going on. There's early data available from the Ultragenics trial, and improvements have been seen in development on the Bailey, the Vineland, the Orca, and the CGI. And I want to show you, this is just a slide of the first five patients. We had to stop the trial for a little while because of a side effect, and so we analyzed the data on these five patients. This red dotted line is the rate of progress of Angelman syndrome in a year. In other words, these patients are making less than a month of progress in all of these different areas of skills. Um, expressive language, receptive, fine motor, gross motor in a year. And the dots represent the amount of, of progress each of these individual patients made while they were on treatment with the ASO um, in six to 12 months. So um, these patients, although they're not making normal progress, they're making substantially better progress than we would expect Angelman patients to make. And just a few little, this is just a video I have of this patient pre-treatment and she's trying to step over a bar, but she has no idea what the bar is, and she just crashes into it. And then this is after two months on treatment. The PT is not actually holding her, but she knows where the bar is, and she's stepping over it. And Angelman patients never make developmental progress at that rate. So, and I also have similar videos from this patient for catching a ball, using a fork, walking up a hill, and swimming. So, um, this is very exciting, but we're going to need much more time to know how much development is possible over what time frame and um, it, with starting treatment at what age, um, because we would think earlier would be better. Um, oops. 
Um, so with all of these new treatments coming into play, disease foundations, parent-founded um, foundations are all setting up to be ready for clinical trials of genetic strategies for treating the disease. And this is just the um, different consortia that we participate in, but these um, organizations are setting up clinic consortia, standardizing care delivery, collecting natural history and doing outcome measure studies, and setting up clinical trial networks and, and re registries. And so they can see this is the, the wave of the future is genetic treatments for their genetic condition. And then even more excitingly, we um, now can do something called N of one trials. And this is the ultimate in personalized medicine. So if there's a mutation in whatever gene for whatever disease, the mutation matters, not the disease. Um, this could, that is treatable with an antisense oligonucleotide, then in the NLORM Foundation will make free antisense oligonucleotides at Ionis and donate for patient treatment forever. The clinician has to submit an N of one protocol to the FDA. They have a new process for this, and NLORM helps with that with all of the chemistry stuff for the ASO. Um, and typically the patient begins their N of one natural history study a year or two before the ASO is ready while it's in production. And when we administer numerous clinically relevant access assessments to track pre-treatment what their trajectory is, and then we will use those same assessments to track them post-treatment because this is really the only way to demonstrate whether they're responding to treatment. We're an NLORM site at Rush. We're tracking two PEX-1 patient and a Nelson patient in preparation for treatment when their ASO is ready. And this will be very exciting. We will be able to reverse the impact of the disease-causing mutation genetically with the ASO, and we'll be able to see how much improvement in different diseases we can get with genetic correction. And so um, genetic neurological disorders and pediatric neurology diseases that were previously untreated are, are, are uh, being starting to be treated and we're moving toward a field with more than just supportive treatment with numerous different strategies in preclinical or clinical development. And these are just the symbols show you all the different strategies in development for Neiman Pick, Fragile X, Angelman syndrome, Rett syndrome, Fetal McDermott syndrome, and um, various forms of Batten's disease. And then there are other new strategies that are still just in preclinical studies. So it's a very exciting time. And basically the field of pediatric, this is just going to accelerate with the years and pediatric neurology is going to be a much changed field in the future from what it was um, in the past. Um, and so I have a final question, um, which I'm supposed to give you all. Um, and so the question is, antisense oligonucleotides are a disease reversing therapy for which disease through correction of abnormal splicing of a copy um, for which disease, of a copy gene for which disease? Um, fragile X syndrome, Angelman syndrome, Neiman pick type C, or SMA? Okay, the answer is D, and the explanation is that antisense oligonucleotides are in trials to collect correct defects in multiple neurological diseases, although they are in trials for Angelman syndrome based on a genetic correction strategy to block production of the UBE3A antisense transcript. Specifically, they correct disease in spinal muscular atrophy by changing the splicing of a copy gene to increase production of the full-length SMA protein, providing a genetic correction that has a dramatic effect on disease symptoms. And this is currently approved by FDA for treatment of SMA as Spinraza. Here are my disclosures. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barry Kravis. Uh, at this point, I would like to invite our speakers to um, turn on their videos so that we can begin the uh, discussion session and answer some of the questions in the in the Q&A section. 
thank you all for excellent talks. Um, Dr. Burfing, I guess we'll start with you. Um, there are a few questions in the chat and the question and answer section. Uh, first, can you please comment on non-pharmacological options for refractory migraine headaches in pediatric population? Um, so, yeah, so when I think of what comes to mind is cognitive behavioral therapy for the treatment of um, non one of the non-pharmacologic treatments for pediatric migraine. And there have been a number of studies, or at least a couple of studies. There was a Cochrane review that was published in 2014, as well as a meta-analysis in 2017 that reviewed um, the efficacy of CBT against um, a placebo and, and pain, and especially and many of those included um, headaches and migraine headaches. And there was data to support that um, this was more effective over placebo. Um, and so, yes, it, it's, it is important to consider this as a treatment for migraine headaches. The problem with it is that um, it's hard to find um, necessarily like psych, uh, psychologists who can um, who are trained in this area um, and know enough about um, kind of like uh, headaches and migraines and, and so forth. Um, so it's hard to find and get these patients in um, for this sort of therapy. And then the other thing is, is that there's still like a stigmata um, around going, uh, recommending um, a psychological treatment for, for patients. And so sometimes the parents give up, put, give us a little bit of a resistance um, in terms of getting the patients into psychotherapy. But the cognitive behavioral therapy includes um, education about migraine headaches, psychology, and then the biofeedback um, and relaxation. So it's definitely something that should be considered and you should encourage this in all your patients. And there's a lot of good data, especially in the migraine population, a little bit less in the tension headache population, but um, it, sh it, it is um, important as a, it, I think it is effective. Yeah. It seems to me that cognitive behavioral therapy is an effective treatment for many conditions, including epilepsy, uh, in those patients who have comorbid anxiety. Um, and, and, and with all of the um, uh, hurdles uh, to getting CBT in our patient, it seems like we should be trying to initiate that sooner rather than later um, You know, in that process, if we can. But I agree with you, it's sometimes difficult to get those therapies. Um, a kind of a corollary question, do you frequently recommend biofeedback therapy and relaxation techniques for children with migraines? And so th the answer is yes. And it's something, again, it, it's helpful, especially pa with patients with chronic migraine headaches. It's this important type of therapy as well. So definitely, and there's evidence to support that it does, it is helpful. Um, in fact, in the preventative, um, in, the, in the treatment trials, they looked at um, amitriptyline and CBT together. The amitriptyline alone was not effective in terms of the preventative, uh, or they didn't find that it was effective. Um, but when they used CBT and amitriptyline, there was, it was effective in reducing um, headaches. Unfortunately, in that particular trial, they didn't look just at the CBT um, alone. Um, so we don't know if, if CBT alone would have been effective, but that just there's just a lot of evidence out there that supports that CBT, which includes the biofeedback as well as relaxation training, is important. Yes, we should we should be doing this for all of our patients or recommending this for all of our patients. Along the theme of non-pharmacological management was a question regarding excessive screen time uh, and whether or not that may be uh, leading to some headaches or visual accommodation defects. Um, how do you counsel your patients in terms of um, minimizing uh, their screen time in, in an in an academic environment for them, which is becoming increasingly more dependent on technology. That was one of the questions. Yeah, I mean, and especially in the adolescents, they're, it's thought that they have um, spend about at least nine hours or more on screen time per day. Um, and so this is definitely with regards to the eye, the eye strain and like your posture, um, all kind of um, playing a role in terms of triggering um, or um, eliciting headaches in, in the pediatric population. Um, so, you know, you want to try to limit it if possible, but that's not always possible. Um, so they recommend um, with regards to screen time, um, taking breaks, kind of looking up from your screen, so screen um, several times, maybe blinking a little bit. You also shouldn't be sitting um, close to the screen. It should be, if you're on your computer, it should be um, 
about two feet away from you and your text, the text um, of the word should be large. All of this is going to help reduce eye strain. Um, the computer light should be like um, similar to the ambient lights. So that's something else to consider. And then um, it's been thought that um, the blue light from the computer can alter the melatonin production um, and alter circadian rhythm. So um, at night, you wanna just ask the kids to put their computers away um, and all of their screens away at least an hour or so before they go to bed um, so that they can fall asleep. So that's usually, um, some. those are some things, thoughts in terms of recommending um, alterations in screen time. But yeah, so. Any thoughts from the panelists? Uh, anything that any of you recommend to your patients? I, I usually tell them kind of what happens in school stays in school, meaning they need to do their education and your Chromebooks, et cetera. And then I usually limit them to, or try to limit them to no more than two hours per day of screen time that is non-academic, meaning, and, and they get to choose how to use that, whether it's looking at YouTube videos or playing video games, but that's kind of what I've done. Um, Dr. Romanceva, uh, should a clinician consider genetic testing in children with epilepsy without encephalopathy? I guess the, the idea here is that epilepsy is a disorder at the extremes of life, and, and early on, a lot of our epilepsies are due to genetic causes, um, and we may not identify those kids uh, early on that may go on to develop more progressive problems. So um, what's your thoughts on, on getting genetic testing in, in kids who maybe aren't clearly uh, developmentally delayed or uh, kids that you're not quite concerned that will progress that way? Great question. Um, so I think the it's important to think about it early and, and, and sort of at least my way of thinking about it is I give this child six months to a year to respond to the standard treatment. So I think it's from the outset, you know, you kind of, you want to think about this way. So first of all, I think so it's good to consider genetic treatment and to uh, gen genetic story screening and to go forward with it. If within the time frame that you expect this, um, the, the seizures to be controlled and epilepsy to be around, it doesn't turn around. That's one thing. So the, the response is not what you expect for your treatment. Um, or if on the initial encounter, if you already from the overall phenotype, which is the seizures and the development and also relevantly the family history uh, and any other neurologic issues going on, you get a sense that this has already a flavor of a genetic epilepsy. So I think if you, if, if, if we get that sense already from initial encounter, then definitely that, that, that question should be that properly answered with, with what tools we have available. Um, because I think that the more, uh, the more we know about the, the specifics, especially if, if from the outset, there's a, there's a flavor of genetic epilepsy. I think the, the more tailored we can make our treatment. Dr. Barry Kravis, I'm kind of interested in your thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think, I mean, from a standpoint of sometimes the epilepsy screening is actually sort of a way of replacing the fact that we don't have newborn screening yet for some of the more severe diseases that we actually have treatment for like CLN2, um, where the first seizure is really kind of a sign. But 80% of CLN2 patients will actually have some developmental delay at the time that they present with a seizure. And so certainly, if you have developmental delay and a new onset seizure in a kid under age eight, there's no reason for you not to get genetic testing because that kid could be a kid that's gonna go rapidly downhill. And initially you're gonna think it's because of the epilepsy and all the drugs you're using, but later on, it's gonna become clear that it's their underlying brain disease. And so I think if there's any inkling and these kids with the developmental delay, I'm not talking about like, they're not walking at three or something like that. They're, they can have very subtle developmental delay, but it's there if you take a good, history and really look at where they're functioning relative to same age peers. So I think certainly if there's any inkling of that, although I tend to err on just because, um, and, and I'm biased, of course, because I see all these kids with the devastating diseases is mainly what I do. And so I see the families that come in and say, 
Dr. So-and-so didn't test us. And now we went like a year and now, you know, he's not walking anymore. And now, you know, we can give him enzyme, but we're never going to get him walking again. So I think there's, we, we have to figure out where we're going with this. And um, if, if we had screening ahead of time for these disorders, then we wouldn't maybe have to, we wouldn't have to use epilepsy panels as a way of basically doing pre-symptomatic screening for, for people. But um, I would, I would uh, emphasize what Luba said, but also say it's not, that it's not necessarily that kid that's massively developmental delay. It's the kid with the early inkling of developmental delay and a seizure that is really needs to be tested. Yeah, you, so I'm going to segue a little bit to a question I had regarding your talk. Do you foresee us performing whole exomic sequencing on every child born uh, instead of our, our typical newborn screening, uh, meaning as it becomes more cost effective? Or should we just keep adding single gene analyses for those conditions that we have treatments for? And if so, so it, okay. what are the ethical concerns to parents who may not want to know the other risks, such as breast cancer or something down the line? Yeah, yeah that's a really good question. And of course, there are already a number of um, sort of pilot programs going on with early, with exome, se with exome um, sequencing um, on babies and, you know, newborn babies to try to understand um, what are we going to find and what are the, what are the risks. And I, I, as the technology increases, I think there's going to be more and more push to do this because um, the real advantage is that we can identify diseases like SMA and, and many other things that are in the same sort of situation where if you employ your genetic treatment early when the patient is early symptomatic or pre-symptomatic, you can have the optimal outcome and you can have a person who's a functional person rather than, you know, waiting for the disease to progress part way and sort of keeping a person in this dysfunctional state of being for a long time once you finally do employ the treatment. So it's very important for rare diseases that are gonna have more, that we're gonna have more and more rare diseases with targeted treatment strategies. Tremendously important for that. But there are these uninterpretable variants that we're gonna find that we're not gonna know whether they cause disease. And then they're gonna be identification of late onset diseases. And I think these, these pilot programs are critical because we need to understand how to manage this. When do we tell people about what we found? Do we ever tell them? Um, do we tell them at birth? Um, and and what, what patients want and, and how they wanna make choices about what they wanna find out from that. And what I wanna really emphasize is we need change in the RUSP. Right now, the RUSP is looking at like one, they, 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 their capacity is kind of to add one or two diseases over a, a one or a couple year period. And that's just not going to work as we get an explosion of treatments that require you to identify the diagnosis at birth, like Menke's disease and molybdenum cofactor deficiency. These are diseases that actually have a treatment that if you employ it right at birth, it will basically save the child. But if you do it later, it's not going to work. So um, we need to be able to change more rapidly and add diseases on to newborn screening um, faster. And eventually it's gonna be so many diseases that you might as well sequence the whole exome rather than sequencing all these individual, all these individual genes. So I think change has to happen, but we need to study it carefully and figure out how to best manage it. Yeah, for those of you who are unfamiliar with RUSP, that's the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel. Dr. Ochoa, um, some questions for you. Uh, who should make and deliver the diagnosis of autism to families? The PCP, PEDS neurologist, developmental specialist, does this delay the diagnosis and access to services? Yes. Um, yeah, this is a great question. Um, there's uh, the, the prevalence of autism is so high. We have, um, and there's so much public and professional awareness. We have, you know, in Chicago, developmental pediatricians have one to two year waiting lists, and these diagnoses get delayed because of those waiting lists. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's not a matter of a specialty. It's a matter of who is able to tease out, understands the criteria for autism, and can tease out the developmental delays from these social communication deficits. And also, um, you know, many patients, you see them, and right away, you know, that they have autism, but it's important also to be able to explain to families about the condition, the trajectory, and, and the services that can help these families um, 
help their children have a better trajectory because definitely early interventions can make a difference for um, uh, improvement in the short term, but more importantly, long-term outcomes. So, um, you know, the developmental behavioral pediatricians are in a better position to diagnose this condition. Uh, because of our specialty, we work in a team, but I think child neurologists that uh, are interested in autism, and I think also pediatricians that have an interest and see enough patients uh, that can do this um, well, I, I, I think it's not just a matter of one specialty, but who, who is interested, who understands the condition, and who sees the patients with uh, enough frequency. Yeah. To dovetail off of your your comments, as well as your first slide about autism increasing, um, you know, the COVID crisis has made delivering early intervention services really very challenging. Uh, are there data on uh, regarding the negative impact to children with autism? And alternatively, how did the pandemic kind of um, change your approach in evaluating and treating these children? I'm just so, curious myself. Yeah. So, something something that happened with the uh, pandemic is that you know for a, for a, uh, for a number of months and even up to now there has been an increase in um, in video uh, evaluations and video provision of services. Um, there has been a reduction of the workforce. A lot of therapists retired, so there's um, there's definitely less access. Um, early intervention is a service that um, is supposed to be uh, family centered. So ideally you, what you do in early intervention, you train the parents to stimulate their children, uh, the, the children's development. So, you know, it should be okay to do telemedicine because you're working with the parents. But uh, the problem is that not all the therapies are equipped to do that. And many families don't like that. Many families think that early intervention is a matter of giving the therapy to the child and don't like it when the, the child doesn't participate. So I, I feel there, there has been, um, not, not everyone has implemented it well. I think a lot of families with, particularly with lower socioeconomics have less access to video uh, therapies. So there's definitely less access and there've been a lot of kids that uh, fall in the cracks in this period of time, even up to now. Um, so that's an issue. And uh, answering the second part of your question in terms of the, how have we changed um, our uh, approach? Um, we were kind of aggressive <laughs> in that we went back in person in, in July, I think of 2020. Uh, we felt that, you know, in order to evaluate a kid, you really needed to see them in person. We were wearing masks and the, the children were wearing masks. We were concerned about the ADOS, the autism evaluation, if the children were going to be spoke seeing the, the, third, the clinician evaluating them with a mask, but they were seeing their parents with a mask. So, uh, it didn't seem to be much of an issue to wear the mask for the for the in-person evaluations. I know that there have been a lot of um, teams across the country that have developed systems to evaluate children with telemedicine. I um, I think for the clearly autistic children, that's not a problem. You can diagnose with, via video, but there are a few kids that are a little milder presentation or are not a clear cut or they are younger where, um, it might be hard to to diagnose through a video. That does, and eventually you need to bring them to the to the office. I'm going to segue into a question from one of our attendees. Um, in the adult neurology clinic, we see adults with autism who have never been evaluated formally with diagnostic interviews, genetics, etc. Is it the same workflow that you describe for children for the work up in adults? Do the same teams do the same testing typically for adults? I feel the, the, the place where um, a physician has uh, advantage in assessing uh, autism in a child is with young children. I think um, developmental behavioral pediatricians, pediatric neurologists, pediatricians uh, understand development and can tease out better developmental delays and um, um, significant impairments of social communication deficits. So I think in children under five, um, physicians are uh, with, the, with the knowledge, with expertise are in a better position to diagnose autism. Once you go to after five years of age, um, a psychologist is, um, you know, is probably in a better position. You wanna do the ADOS to diagnose these children. 
So I feel that it changes after you cross the five year or depending on each place and the expertise of the psychologist. But in general, I would say after five, you know, we usually have a psychologist doing the ADOS and taking the, the bulk of the uh, diagnostic approach. But I, I, I think it's still the neurologist, uh, uh, the adult neurologist should um, collect the information and, and recommend genetic testing according to the diagnosis. Dr. Burfin, uh, the CGRP medications are not yet approved for use in children, but are headache specialists using these medications regularly for children? What percentage of children in headache clinics are on these medications? And I uh, please, after Dr. Burfin's response, anyone who wants to chime in can. Yeah, so I don't know what percentage um, of headache specialists are using the CGRP in adolescents. I can only speak for what we're doing here at Rush. Um, we use them sparingly um, because they have not been uh, approved by the FDA, but we, I have used them in some patients who are refractory to all other, the preventative medications and who have significant migraine-related disability. They're missing a lot of school um, and just have like some psychological aspects to because of the headaches. So it is, so they're definitely... You can use them. I would use them sparingly. And I think that we are all beginning to use, use these in patients who have um, a significant mig migraine related disabilities. And the patients that I've used the, the CGRP monoclonal antibodies in, um, have they, they haven't had any significant side effects and they've done fairly well. So I think that, and these are patients that are older, um, they're in the older adolescent population that I've used them in. So I can't necessarily speak for everybody, the rest of the you know, pediatric neurology um, world, um, but I can just talk about what we do here. And so we are using them, yeah, so. Yeah, I've used them as well uh, in that uh, population you described uh, and to typically older child and more adult size, if you will, in terms of weight. And, and I've noticed some success with them, actually. I, I would say it's probably less than 10% of my clinic, uh, although I do see older individuals. Does Rush have an inpatient headache unit for the management of refractory headache disorders? We don't have a specific headache unit, but if need be, we will admit patients and treat them in, inpatient when, when necessary. But we don't have a specific headache inpatient headache unit. Uh, Dr. Romanceva and Dr. Barry Kravis, in ASO studies in adults, uh, like Huntington's disease, steroids have been used to prevent side effects. Is this strategy also being used in children in the ASO therapies? Hey, Liz, you can take this one. You have a bit more experience. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's not formally being used. It's not written into any protocols that I know of, but I do know that there are certain centers that are um, incorporated into the to their site-specific protocol. Um, it's, it's, there's no, it's not clear how well it works. There's been no really good formal collection of data, but I think as time goes on, we'll have more information about, um, how well steroids may prevent, um, at least, you know, localized effects, whether it would prevent the hydrocephalus is another thing that appears to be a class effect of, of ASOs. Um, and it, it seems to have something to do with the specific sequence or structure of the ASO that may be a little bit difficult to predict, there is some safety screening that is, there's a, there's a lot of safety screening that's done um, before the ASO is used. And there are some things that can be detected perhaps better than others. And so I'm not sure we have a solid way of predicting whether the hydrocephalus will, will occur, but it's definitely important to take each ASO through numerous steps of screening on safety for inflammatory issues and other things before um, taking it into the person. And now, uh, more recently for N of 1 studies, there's a guideline that came out that has suggested, you know, at least doing screening MRIs in patients to, at, at least in, in the, you know, at least when they, at the beginning, when they start the ASO to try to determine whether, um, whether hydrocephalus is occurring. So um, this is a story that we'll be, that we'll, we'll learn more about as the years go on. Um, I had a question uh, in terms of, um, I assume that you have to deliver these medications or these therapies rather, ASO enzyme replacement periodically. Are there strategies to develop infusions that, you know, periodic infusion 
mechanisms. I know we're quite not there yet. We're still studying these things, but um, it, it would seem to me very labor intensive. Yeah, it's a little labor intensive. Um, most of the ASOs only have to be delivered, like in, there's an initial booster period, like with SMA where they're delivered every two weeks initially or every month. And then and then they go to delivery usually every, about every four months. So it's not tremendously frequent. Um, when in NPC where we're delivering cyclodextrin every two weeks, um, you can do it. I mean, and there've been numerous lumbar ports that have been tried. Actually, the problem with lumbar ports is they when you when the person is using it for life, they tend to they tend to move around, and these kids have seizures and dystonia, and or they or they go out and play soccer, and um, they the ports move and they've migrated up um, up the spinal canal. They've come out. They've gotten infected. There are all kinds of things that have gone on. So it's been very challenging to actually get the port to the to get these ports to the point where they're very usable. Obviously, if the delivery is intracerebroventricular, then we do use a port for that. Um, but so far, the the LPs, I mean, while it's invasive a little, I mean, we have the LPs down to kind of a, you know, just a protocol where people come in, they get their LP, it takes 10 or 15 minutes, and they're out of clinic in less than an hour. So it's not a lot longer than having a routine clinic visit. And once people get in a pattern of doing this, it it is it's it's a very short-term procedure and may have less risk than having a chronic indwelling um, kind of apparatus like a port. Um, the, the need for anesthesia is a bigger issue because then when you have to do anesthesia to put the child to sleep for every um, ASO delivery. But I think our hope is that we'll get so good at treating these disorders that the kids will not have severe developmental delays anymore, and then they won't need anesthesia. Right. But that, of course, is a hope for the future. <laughs> so a uh, uh, couple left uh, questions left from the audience. We are seeing improvement in the quality of life with early therapeutic intervention in the genetic neurological disorders. How are the changes in the life expectancy of these patients? Well, I think we're clearly seeing, in, in association with slowing of the disease, we're seeing increased life expense. I mean, certainly in SMA, you know, if people don't go on ventilators at, at two with SMA one, they're they're going to die. Um, and so now we have SMA patients who are who are living much much longer than that, and who are even functional and walking. Um, the Batten's patients that I see in clinic, for instance, um, who are getting out to age nine, ten years old are reaching the age when most Batten's patient, but when, when most CLN2 patients would die, but they're not really close to death. So um, I think we are going to, the lifespan is going to lengthen as the neurological disease decrease. I think the bigger question is, um, where are we freezing these patients? And um, are we waiting until the disease is still is severe and then just keeping them in a very disabled state for a long time? And we need to get to the point of being able, to, it's the being able to treat early that allows them to have not just a longer lifespan, but a productive longer lifespan. Yeah. Dr. Ochoa, I, I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of bothered me for a while. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, you know, as you know, as you pointed out, the DSM-5 did away with many of the alternative diagnoses, um, you know, such as pervasive developmental delay and childhood disintegrative disorder. And I'm wondering if there was an advantage to keeping some of those diagnoses, such as childhood disintegrative disorder. Uh, in, in particular, approximately 50% of uh, children with uh, childhood disintegrative disorders uh, have abnormal EEGs. Uh, you know, and, and likely have probable electrical status epilepticus of slow wave sleep. Uh, so I was just wondering if, if we're calling all of these children autism, sh when should we consider doing an EEG in these children? Um, yeah, I found the childhood disintegrative disorder diagnosis uh, helpful because it implied a kid with normal development, initial, language development initially, and a rapid regression. Um, so I was kind of disappointed that, that that was removed. Um, having said that, should we order EGs on all children uh, who demonstrate regression or more broadly? Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting question. Um, DSM-4 had this 
five categories of autism spectrum disorders, which, you know, the, the, the autism community was more vocal about the removal of Asperger uh, syndrome. And, um, you know, I, I've seen patients, younger patients that were more like classic autism. And at some point when they were growing up, when they got into school age, they look more like Asperger syndrome. Yeah. And I've seen patients that, you know, were classic autism trajectories having siblings that had Asperger syndrome. So I think at the end, the, the, um, the American Psychiatry Association team that were working on the criteria for autism considered that these subcategories were not really scientifically valid and were not helping advance the field. Um, and that, that's the reason they made the decision. We, we know that, you know, there, there are going to be categories, but um, we, they, I think the, the understanding was we didn't know enough to do categories that could help advance the field. Um, but, you know, going to childhood integrative, disintegrative disorder, uh, that's a, you know, and that brings the question about regression, right? Uh, regression is quite common in patients. Uh, regression presentation is quite common in patients with autism. Uh, that's what caused the problem with the vaccines, which we know is not true. Like there's no uh, role of the vaccines in, in the um, etiology of autism. But I, I think at least 20 to 30% of patients with autism present like they were doing that something happens between nine months and three years of age where um, there's some sort of social disconnection that kid, these kids get disconnected socially and some of them stop talking and then they uh, they become more um, like they have more uh, mannerisms, more sensory issues, more autistic sensory issues. And, and parents say something changed. And there have been studies that demonstrate that that really happens, that autism shows up in this age group. Um, I, I think a lot of times, you know, there was this classic um, birthday study for kids that had this regression presentation where they were doing videos at one year of age on these kids that they eventually regress into autism. And so and it, the, the, the video showed that a lot of these kids had already some features of autism that were not identified by the parents. So I think a lot of times this is a pseudo regression, like the majority of patients with autism that have this presentation is more like a pseudo regression. And I think as a rule of thumb, people talk about five or eight words, uh, less than five or eight words is not really a regression, is, is not really a regression, but if it's more than five or eight words, is, is a real regression and, and warrants um, like a neurological workup, like an EEG and, and a referral to a neurologist. So that's that's what I usually follow. If I hear a, a history that tells me that there were more than five words, particularly if those words were used in a functional way, as opposed to more like echolalia or, or a repetitive way, I, I refer these patients for uh, a, a neurology consultation and EEG. Um, I think the other um, the other reasons where we think about doing EEGs and neurology consultations is when there are significant developmental delays, which that would fit uh, the childhood disintegrative disorder presentation. And also a, a lot of patients with autism have a staring spells and that's part of the autism presentation. Yeah. But we usually, if there's a good history of uh, interruptibility of these staring spells, then we we wait and see. But if, if there is an unclear history, which is most of the time, right, it's not totally clear, um, then we, we refer for um, neurology consultation. All right, last question. Um, we're going to end in about a minute because uh, I want uh, everyone to grab a break. And then I'm going to encourage all of the um, uh, attendees to participate or to exhibit our exhibitor hall and participate in the clue word scavenger hunt uh, uh, as there will be prizes. Um, but this last question uh, came from one of our attendees and um, it's a question I've certainly asked, um, what should we do differently to encourage trainees to consider both pediatric neurology and developmental behavioral pediatrics uh, as a specialty? Well, I'll just throw in my two cents. I think that the field of pediatric neurology is on the brink of being an extremely exciting specialty. And I think people just need to rotate and watch us change the lives of kids. And there's going to be more interest. I think there's been a failure of interest in pediatric neurology because people perceive it just as like 
you know, a specialty where we just follow kids and maybe we can diagnose some of them, but we don't really have it. It's not a treatment specialty, but I think the fact that it's going in that way, hopefully will encourage more people to come into it. But I think in order for people to make that decision, they need to know what's going on. I agree. And having, you know, med students rotate early on child neurology. Yeah. Yeah. I've had numerous, numerous trainees say, oh, this is like so different from what I thought it would be. So different from my, you know, per clinical years and kind of different in a good and exciting way. So I think just get, getting them to, you know, to see the actual patients with us is going to help a lot. Any other thoughts? If not, go ahead, Dr. Ochoa. No, I just wanted to say the same. Like I, um, you know, having people, people think that development may be a little boring, but, um, you know, you you can do, um, you you know, it's a very intense uh, specialty where you talk to families, help families, you can help change trajectories just with, you know, a, a timely diagnosis, good interventions, psychopharmacology. And now, you know, with this, what uh, Dr. Barry Kravitz was saying, you know, this avalanche of uh, neurogenetic treatments is, is such an exciting field. Okay, with that, I thank you all for the excellent presentations. And again, uh, please uh, join, uh, join us at the exhibitor hall. Uh, you have a, a brief break and then we'll see you for the next session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.